It also says this profound respect. It also uses the phrase awe. Collins English Dictionary, which is a dictionary I never heard of before, describes reverence as having reverence for someone or something. It is a feeling of great respect and honor. So um, what I'd like to do uh, in this moment of reverence is to uh, read to you, and I, this is where I ask my colleagues patience and indulgence, but I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll lend it to me, a list of heroes for hope. Uh, this particular night, given what we're going through, we have a lot of heroes in our community, but I want folks to know, because my colleagues know this, we have a lot of heroes in our district. And uh, the list of names that I'm going to read tonight are individuals who courageously and selflessly accepted to work when we first learned about school closures. These employees produced, packed, and distributed breakfasts, lunches, and other meals to our students, their parents, and the community at large. So again, I ask for your indulgence as I read with great reverence and respect on behalf of the entire Board of Education, a list of our employees, Rochester City School District employees, who are serving their community with honor, decency, and respect. And to those people that I'm about to misspell their names or mispronounce names, my sincerest apologies. Omaira, Bouchard, Wanda Espinoza Ramos, Tanisha Rabbi, Teresa Cannon, Atha Falds, Pamela Robinson, William Fogarty, Sebastian Gengemani, Antonio Jerez, somebody help me there, Gerald Wilson, Daryl Wright, Olfa Arca Santana, Barbara Vitaglia, Jennifer Borges, Deborah Bowen, Dawn Kalia, Sharon Cash, Tracy Darrison, Kelvin Davis, Edward Filong, Bonnie Ferrari, Dominica Gusty, Beverly King, Marketh Logan, Leonel Leonella Melanine Melanau. I apologize, I, I know I have that one wrong. Carolyn Manning, Wanda Mercado, Sonia Nova, Tina M. Palomari, Nick, Nick, I'm, I know I'm gonna mangle your name, Papa Kalaraskos, sorry, Nick. We really do appreciate work, I apologize for that. Joan Peroni, Don Shepard, Natalie Torres, Fidel Torres, Jacqueline Torres Velez, Sharon Colantano, Kalantani, John Kriegel, Kathleen Lucas, Kathleen Yorks, Sadia Abadi, Rutelia Colazo, Ruth Delgado, Maria Goyette, Janice Lightly, Carrie Monegro, Florine Nelson, Josette Torres, Madeline Torres Correa, Elsie Vargas, Danya Turner, Marcy Lindsay, Jerry Rowe, Kathleen Tech, Angela Gonzalez, Miguel Lorenzo Diaz, Hector Perez, Jose Rodriguez, Melvin James, Terrence Jones, Ivory Oliver, Jason Brinson, Jeffrey Pachanio, Raymond Meyer, David Brown, Badali Akinya, and Mike Smith. On behalf of the entire Board of Education and our Superintendent of Schools, we thank you and honor you as our heroes for hope. Uh, and on, we can give them a, a virtual round of applause. Uh, I see Commissioner Adams tipping his hat to them. We really do appreciate your work and we realize that while many of uh, people out in the community have very difficult jobs, yours is a particularly precarious one. Um, you are working with people, you're handling, uh, so it takes great courage. So this is not just about, we want people to understand, the Board of Education understands, this is not just about people doing their job, but this is about people risking their own personal safety to serve others. 
it is appreciated and respected. And you are our first Heroes for Hope. And uh, we encourage people to make recommendations for other Heroes of Hope in the future, because these are unusual times we're living in, and they require heroes. And we have them in our own midst as district employees. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is minutes from the January 23rd, 2020, February 27th, 2020, and March 12th, 2020. Those minutes have to be approved by motion. Is there a motion? So moved. Well, I move. Been moved by Commissioner Powell. Is there a second? Second by Vice President Elliott. I think that's who I heard. Um, all those in favor of approval of those minutes, say aye. 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 Madam Clerk, I won't bother to take a voice voice vote on that. Is that necessary? Do you want a voice vote on it? Oh, I'm fine. You're okay. Okay, yes. thank you. All right. Next item in the agenda is a speakers list. I know Commissioner Powell had some questions about that. I just want to say, as a preliminary matter, that uh, repeatedly we have discussed the fact that at some point uh, we might get more than just a few speakers. Uh, as I understand it, last count there were 39 virtual speakers whose uh, opinions and comments and concerns uh, should be read into the record or distributed to the board members. I want to say that um, normally I had, I want to be very transparent about this, I had had some plans to recommend to you all that we reduce that number of speakers and not read them all, maybe take a third and distribute it according to topics. My recommendation, and it's only a recommendation because you all make the call, but that we read them on. I want to explain why I'm advocating that we read them all. As you all can see, because you have it right there in front of you because of uh, Kaya's great work, a number of them raise questions about RIA. And the reason why I think it is important, just my recommendation, that we have our staff, and they're going to split it up, read them all into the record is, you may recall several meetings ago, the subject of RIA came up. And I indicated to people, um, after hearing the superintendent indicate that RIA was not going to close, that they did not have to speak. They could speak, but they did not have to. Um, many people, as you all recall, decided not to speak that night because of uh, uh, my representations and the representations of the superintendent. I think it would be a mistake, given the concerns about RIA that have risen again, uh, to not allow their voices to be heard. I'm not passing judgment on what happened. I do know this happened. People wanted to speak based on what I said. They opted not to. And I would just like to not have them happen to them what happened before. But again, I realize this is a board decision. So that's my recommendation. Anybody else want to be heard on how we will handle all these uh, remarks? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have the screen up. I can't see who's raising their hand because the agenda's up there. Uh, and, and by the way, Tom, I don't have the hand raising device appearing, but um, I think I heard Commissioner LeBron say something. And I know Commissioner Powell wanted to no? Commissioner Powell, you want to start? And I see Vice President Elliott raising her hand. Commissioner Powell? Well, I don't need to start, but since you have acknowledged me, um, I. I appreciate what you just said. That's very sensitive of you. Um, and um, I would also like to hear the superintendent speak directly to that point. Uh, but in some cases, the uh, speaker's uh, written comments are in fact, and, and this does not apply to the students, I don't think, but um, in, in some instances, the, the speaker's submissions are essentially a form letter and they're absolutely identical one to another. I think there are some instances where they are, they have been tailored, but so my question is in the, in the, on the occasions where the remarks are word for word the same as another uh, submission, can we have them read only once and um, a tat assign the names of all of those uh, people who submitted uh, so that we know that that came <clears> from <throat> multiple people. Is that an opt option um, from a parliamentary process point of view? Uh, Carl, I think that raises two questions, a parliamentary issue and then logistical. I don't know if our staff 
uh, separated them and looked at whether there was some boilerplate stuff working, uh, which I think is what you're referring to. Uh, Carl, you want to answer the parliamentary question and then uh, 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 our clerk can answer the logistical one? Yes, although it would provide uh, require that the board suspend uh, so much of its bylaws to the contrary. Uh, the logistics, I'll uh, uh, defer to our clerk. Uh, on. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, you want to comment on that? And I, I again, I, I got my screen up that indicates who the participants are. I see Commissioner Shepard has raised her hand. So after um, our clerk uh, responds to the logistical issues, then um, uh, we'll hear next from Commissioner Shepard. So in terms of the logistics for today, I have not reviewed the comments to the detail that would be necessary to determine whether the comments are verbatim uh, submitted. So unfortunately, I will not be able to make that determination today. Okay, let's begin with Commissioner Shepard. Um, yeah, so I, I always been supportive of everybody getting um, a chance to voice themselves to us publicly in the meeting if they sign up. I'm okay with that. Um, I know once we get past like 15 or 20, um, I do think we should be cutting it down to two minutes. And then um, Marisol just stops reading at, you know, at the two minute mark. But I do want to take into account um, the fact that, you know, the last time when, when there were things that were associated with Rhea, people didn't speak. And so maybe if just for tonight, they do get the opportunity to have, you know, their full statements read um, and anybody else will be two minutes. Um, I'm okay with that. But I, 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 do, I, I do support everybody having their voices heard who signs up because we did not cut them off or let them know before the meeting. We wouldn't read them into the record. And next seek Vice President Elliott. Yes, uh, Mr. President, I just think it's important for them uh, to be heard. Um, they have been um, given some misinformation that I think needs to have some clarity to it. And I think that um, they left the meeting uh, where they came to speak uh, under one um, thinking one way, but uh, the budget has, um, has indicated something differently. And so I think it's important for the students, the families and the staff there to be able to put on record their thoughts about the decisions that are being made uh, in the superintendent's office. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I next see Commissioner Adams. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm always with people um, being able to voice, voice what they feel. Uh, but I had heard that there was one thing that was like four pages long. Uh, we need to get a mechanism where it can be sent back to them and tell them they have to cut that down. We we can't. Um, we we got to stay within a certain time limit. Um, you just you just can't be unlimited like that. Uh, so in actuality, uh, Commissioner Adams, we actually did post the speaker speaker comments today on our board docs page. It is not something that we've done in the past, but because of the number of uh, comments that we received and the length of some of the comments. What I will ask the board for permission is for some of those that do extend beyond, like the four page one, um, if it could be submitted into the record. And you know, we can go ahead and read it. Kali and I are going to be taking turns. Um, this is not as easy a task as it seems. So to all the newscasters out there, I'll give you props uh, because reading uh, just off the cuff is, is uh, something that isn't that easy. So thank you to Kalia for agreeing to take turns with me, but if it's okay with the board and Carl, I don't know what the um, protocol on that would be. Do we set a timer for ourselves and read it? And when the time is up, we stop reading it. Um, I'm not sure what the procedure there is. And the other thing, Carl, is because we have 39 speakers and that will go over the 60 minute mark as stipulated in the bylaws, will the board members have to um, have a vote to uh, hold off on the bylaws today? Carl? Uh, yes. Um, let me just uh, suggest a quick uh, uh, resolution. Um, 
you could resolve something to the effect that uh, so much of the board's bylaws as governs public comment be suspended so that written comments submitted in accordance with the board's regular procedure be placed on the record by the district clerk or her designee, but that uh, each submission be limited to two minutes in time and that the balance of any submission not read be provided to the commissioners. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the motion just described say aye. Aye. Why don't we take a voice call vote? Um, um, Van, I'll begin with. Van, I've had my hand raised. Oh, I'm, I, I, I thought you were raising it with respect to uh, the, the substance of the conversation. But you're right. We're getting ready to make a decision. So go ahead. I, I missed that. Go ahead. Yeah. So I had requested this before. I'm going to keep requesting it, that any public comments that we do share. I know I just heard my results say we posted it on board docs, but I feel that even with reading, we should still some way somehow capture it online as public record that it's been submitted so that people can also have an opportunity to read it. And I know that the mechanism we use is board docs. I appreciate that it was posted today on board docs. I know that Marisol and Kalia get the comments to us prior to the meeting. So I do have an opportunity, all of us do, to read them as well. Um, but I would still like the community to have an opportunity to read them. And I know everybody doesn't always know how to access board docs versus other methods like our website and so forth, but that's all. Carl, Carl could you modify your motion? Would you feel the need to modify your motion? Because does anybody have any uh, issue with that um, suggestion that they be made available above and beyond board docs? So Carl, is, would your motion need to be amended um, to reflect that recommendation made by Commissioner LeBron? Uh, we could just add uh, uh, to, to, and and by electric uh, uh, or electronic means uh, satisfactory to the district clerk. Makes sense. Uh, all right. So everybody has heard uh, Mr. Christoph's amended motion. Um, uh, Commissioner Powell, I assume you're going to forward that mo amended motion again. Yeah, uh, I think you said yes, but you're on mute. I consider that a friendly amendment, yes. Friendly amendment. Is there a second to that friendly amendment? Second. Second by Commissioner LeBron. Um, any further questions or comments on that uh, amended motion? Commissioner yeah, Adams? I, I just, uh, is this just for when there's over so many people um, submitting um, letters? Because I, I feel like if there's like only 10 people, they should be able to get the whole three minutes. Oh, they would. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Mr. Kristoff? Uh, yes, the, the amendment, as, as I understand it, is applicable only to this evening's meeting where we have, uh, what, 39? Mm -hmm. uh, now, even with 39 speakers, incidentally, folks, at two minutes a crack, we're, we're going to be over the normal 60-minute threshold. So you may want to consider separately whether you want to either suspend that uh, or just simply stop reading letters when you hit the 60-minute mark. I think I have heard, for example, Commissioner Shepard say, and she said it again tonight, she has a preference, and I agree with it, where possible, wherever possible, to read as many of those statements into the record. Uh, I know it does, will delay our proceedings a bit, but this is the people's uh, uh, opportunity to speak. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Okay, so let's, um, that motion so, has been- so then, let's, then let's add, uh, please, Mr. President, uh, yes, sir. An additional and that the established 60 minute uh, time uh, limit be suspended. Uh, Mr. Christoph, would you mind just reading the whole thing again, just so that we're clear on, on what the motion is? Will Thank do. You. Just as soon as I catch up with my notes, please. So Beatrice's hand is up. Uh, no, yep, it, no I, I should lower it. Yep. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Carl, I, I, see commissioner, for, I see commissioner. Right, I think I have it now. Very okay, fun. If not, I have the language for the last two parts if you need me to read those aloud for you. No, I think I have it too. Thank you very much. Uh, so it would be resolved that uh, so much of the board's bylaws as governs public comment be suspended so that written comments submitted in accordance with the board's regular procedure 
be placed on the record by the district clerk or her designee, but that uh, there'll uh, be a time limit of two minutes per submission and that the balance of each submission be provided uh, each commissioner and also uh, by electronic means to the public satisfactory to the district clerk and that the established 60 minute time limit be suspended to accommodate this process. All right, folks, you've heard the motion. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Um, any further comment uh, on the, the motion? Uh, let me just add for clarity's sake, how this came up is I, I take full responsibility for the uh, limiting of conversation in that last meeting regarding RIA. I gave people an option. They chose that option based on what I said. And that's why my feeling is today, they certainly should have the opportunity to voice their concerns today. So that that doesn't fall on anybody but me. And so I want that to be clear because um, I, I literally gave people a choice based on what I said to them. So, all right, all those in favor of the motion as articulated by Mr. Christoph, say aye. Aye. Uh, I'm, gonna aye. Take, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a voice vote. Uh, I'm gonna begin with Commissioner Powell. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Adams. Aye. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner LeBron? Yes. Commissioner Le Malloy? Yes. Uh, Vice President Elliott? Yes. The ayes have it. All right. Um, why don't we begin? It seems like you guys are going to switch off. So I, I assume that maybe a one person is going to read and then um, the other person is going to do the timing. Is that right? Is that how you're going to do it? Is that right, Madam we're, Clerk? I believe we're each, gonna, we're each going to be timing ourselves. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thanks. That being the case, I'm going to have to set up a timer. So I'm really sorry about that. That's all right. Timer, two minutes. Our first comment is from Hussein Amin, who is a ninth grader from Maria. I heard the superintendent Dade wants to get rid of grades K through five, and also get rid of 26 teachers at RIA. I'm writing to you because RIA is a special school that helps every student learn English and be successful in their education. I want you to know that we need RIA because it helps many students to speak, read, and write English. And also, if they don't understand, we have teachers who can translate for them and help them. Some examples of how RIA has helped me and my family are taking care of my family and helping us with what we need, such as making appointments or helping to translate letters that we get in the mail. RIA teachers try their best to give us what we need. And it's not just only my family, they also help other families too. And if they can't afford it, they try to give you something else because RIA doesn't keep its families and students hanging. They always have the encouragement they always find a way. I hope you will not cut K through five and get rid of our teachers because teachers are important to us. I hope you don't separate our RIA family because without family, it will be difficult to rise together and help each other, especially our younger siblings. I don't want the RIA family to be separated because we need our families and loved ones. I hope you see now that it is important to keep grades K through 12 at RIA because together we are family and no family can be successful when they are separated from each other. Please vote no on May 7th. Okay. The next uh, speaker is Dawa Bamjan from Ria, a grade 10 student from Nepal. I heard that Superintendent Dade wants to cut grades K through five from Ria. I also heard that with the new budget, you, we will lose 26 of our Ria teachers. I'm writing to you because Ria is a very supportive school. I want you to know we need Ria because we are family. Ria is a very safe school for all students and Ria's teachers provide the students with the support that they need in order to learn English and be successful. Some examples of how RIA has helped me and my family are when I first came to RIA, I was very scared. 
I thought my teachers would not like me or talk to me and I would not be able to make friends because I did not know very much English, but my teachers were really wonderful. I did not feel uncomfortable talking in the little English that I knew. My parents were really happy when I shared that my teachers are really good and I feel safe in my school. Some of my friends go to other schools and they do not have a good experience like we have at RIA. I hope you will not cut K through five from RIA and I hope that you do not cut or 26 teachers. I do not want my brothers and sisters to go to other schools. They deserve the safety and support that RIA gives. I hope you see now that it is so important to keep grades K through 12 and our teachers at RIA because all students like me need a school like RIA. We are a RIA family. Please vote no on May 7th. Our next comment comes from Supid Magar, who is a student at RIA. I heard that Superintendent Dade wants to cut grades K through five. I'm writing to you because I think that is a horrible thing to do. I want you to know we need RIA because my family and I need RIA so that we can continue to learn new things. RIA is not like other schools where people do not like each other. Even though there are many different religions and cultures, we are all family at RIA. We respect each other. This school is the best school that I have ever attended, and this school is our home. We are a RIA family. We do things together. We help each other whenever someone needs help. RIA has helped me and my family in many ways. One example is during this difficult time of COVID-19. My teachers, language coaches, and principal have translated important information so that we can be safe and prepared. My teacher is always checking to make sure that we have everything we need during this time so that we can be safe and so that we can be prepared. I have experienced another city school and it did not work out for me. The students there were not friendly or were welcoming and I did not feel supported. Students used bad language around me and that made it difficult to learn new things. There was a lot of fighting and I did not feel safe. I am so lucky that I was able to come back to RIA. Now I can keep learning. RIA is the way. I hope you're not going to cut the grades K through five because if you cut them, then I worry those students will have the same bad experience that I had when they go to another school. I hope you see now that it is important to keep grades K through 12 at RIA because our small sisters and brothers need good teachers to learn in a safe and supportive school. Please vote no on May 7th. Our next speaker is Abdullahi Saeed. I heard that Superintendent Dade wants to get rid of RIA K through five and make it a six through 12 school without a transition program for newcomer students. I'm writing to you because to me, RIA is not just a school. At RIA, we are a family and everybody plays a role. I want you to know we need RIA because they help people like me, refugees who come from war-torn countries with little to no English. When you first come to America, it's a feeling you cannot describe. Nothing is familiar. You don't understand what people are saying, but when you come to RIA, you feel loved and cared for. You get the help you need. Some examples of how RIA has helped me and my family are they helped me through a rough time. I didn't know the language. I was struggling to tell people what I wanted to say, but they listened. They helped me. They helped me. Sorry. I'm sorry. Hmm. I'm sorry, folks. All right. Hmm. I will start again. I heard that Superintendent Dade wanted to get rid of RIA K through five and make it a six through 12 school without a transition program for newcomer students. I'm writing to you because to me, RIA is not just a school. At RIA, we are a family and everybody plays a role. I want you to know we need RIA because they help people like me, refugees who come from war-torn countries with little to no English. When you first come to America, it's a feeling you can't describe. Nothing is familiar. You don't understand what people are saying, but when you come to RIA, you will feel loved and cared for. Some examples of how RIA has helped me and my family are they helped me through a rough time. I didn't know the language. I was struggling to tell people what I wanted to say, but they listened. 
They helped me when I needed them most. At one point, I transitioned out of Rhea to another RCSD school. When I went to another school, I felt like I was not getting the education I needed. I felt like I was never going to learn because nobody really cared what I didn't understand that I didn't understand that they were teaching. All they cared about is I was busy doing something in the class. People were not very welcoming. Some people made fun of where I was from. They asked me if I ever ate food before because I came from Somalia. At Rhea, nobody cares how you look, how you dress, or how you think. They respect you for who you are, and I feel like every school should be like that. I asked to come back to Rhea, and it was the best decision I was able to learn, and the staff and teachers saw something in me. They taught me how to be a leader, use my voice, and stand up for what I believe in. I hope you will reconsider this proposal. At Rhea, students feel safe and are able to learn without fear of judgment or ridicule. Family, families are able to be kept together under one roof and parents have comfort knowing their children are all together after coming from areas and countries we come from where there was not always this, where it was not always the case. I do not want to have to go to another school like I did before and face those challenges once again. I hope you see now that is it important to keep grades K through 12 at RIA because RIA is family. Please vote no on May 7th. Sincerely, Abdullahi Saeed. Our next speaker is Mikel Van Aken. He's a student at RIA. Dear RCSD Board of Education, I heard that Superintendent Dade wants to cut grades K through five from RIA to help with the budget problem. I'm writing to you because I don't think it's a good idea. I want you to know we need RIA because it helps children who do not speak English. Some examples of how RIA has helped me and my family are it helped me learn English, helped me make friends, helped me not to be scared to go to school, helped my parents know how to teach me, and they made us like a big family. I hope you will reconsider cutting K grades K through five. I do not want to see RIA change from K-12. I hope you see now that it is important to keep grades K through 12 at RIA because it helps so many children just like me. Please vote no on May 7th. Our next speaker is Bethany Carrion, a parent regarding the RCSD 2021 budget. Hello, this is Bethany Carrion again. Didn't want to overload y'all on Tuesday. So here's the rest. My son's education is priceless. No one can put a tag on his success. The struggles me and Josiah endured is because RCSD put a price tag on him. That is until September, 2016. The suspensions, lack of services, lack of compassion, and lack of accountability from the district level all the way down was unacceptable. I know this firsthand as I've been in the RCSD for 15 years since Josiah was three. I was pulling my kids out of the district August 2016. Parent engagement and Dan Fontanes knew and saw firsthand how fed up I was. I was asked by both to please give RCSD one more chance and I did. It was the absolute best thing I could have done. Both my kids are now since September 2016, high honor students, and my Jacob even received the presidential award. Holla! When I say I have the data and progress to prove Keisha Morgan did her job and did it well, the data speaks pure facts to my kids' success, which is how, which is how and why my Josiah is a senior graduating class of 2020. Holla! So closing the budget gap on the backs of students with disabilities is unacceptable, period. Special education has been historically underfunded and students were not receiving services. We finally changed that. And now y'all wanna demote Keisha and all her hard work? Nope, not today, Satan, not today. Victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. Plus I got a ninth grader, she has to graduate. Holla and God bless. Our next speakers are Paul and Kim Van Aken. They are parents from Rhea. Good evening, board members. We are parents of a RIA student and are very concerned over the recent proposal by Superintendent Day to remove grades K through five from RIA. We feel this decision would not be in the best interest of any newcomer student. Our son Michael was adopted from an orphanage in Bulgaria. He spent the majority of his 11 years there being abused and neglected. He remained home with us for a few weeks to get him adjusted and then we started at our district school. He spoke no English and was illiterate in Bulgarian. 
Although we told them six months prior to his arrival that he would be coming, they failed miserably the two months he spent there. Then only ENL students, they, excuse me, the only ENL students they were used to were Spanish speaking ones whom lived with their birth families and were literate in their language. Their answers school for only two hours a day and a 15 to one classroom ratio because they had no knowledge of how else to help Michael. Michael had no diagnosis. We immediately told them not, to, we immediately told them no to that setting. We were at a loss of what to do for our son's education when a dear friend told us about Rhea. At that point, we set up an appointment with Principal Mar Mary and Olochi Montesano Diaz. We were in tears when, meeting, when the meeting started as we explained our situation. She made us feel so much better, as though we would be part of a family. As she explained how we, Rhea worked, we felt so much better, and she told us what we could expect. Our school district agreed that, and Michael started RIA that September. Michael's success at RIA is due to the commitment that teachers and administration put into their students. They dealt with his emotional needs as well as his education. It all went hand in hand. Michael was seen as a normal student, not an abused child that did not speak English. When he did not want to enter the classroom due to fear, they walked him through it. When his pace was slower than others due to him being illiterate in his native tongue, they were patient. When he was working through his abuse with counselors that cared, they cared for him. They never gave up on our son. He was more than an ENL student to them. He was a newcomer. He was and still is family. Which brings us now to this year. Michael will be graduating with a Regents Diploma in June because RIA is ex exactly what it should be, a perfect school for newcomer students, grades K through 12. Please continue to give this educational opportunity to the students and their families. RIA is not only a school, it is a family. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cheryl Moyer, a parent. I'm a foster mother of unaccompanied refugee minors, and I have had one to three foster sons at RIA every year since 2012. During this time, I've seen the addition of the lower grades to the program and have marveled at the ELL education and the continuity of care this has afforded refugees as they have become members of the Rochester community. From the point of view of a parent, keeping all the children together, especially where there is interpretation support, helps parents stay in touch and participate in their children's education. One reason RIA has become one of the best schools in the district is because of the participation and support of parents. In my opinion, separating younger children from older siblings will dilute the effectiveness and success that RIA has had, has had delivering high quality and graduates to the community. Please reconsider keeping RIA K through 12. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Widmeyer, who is a community member. And their topic is the RCSD 2020-2021 budget. There has to be another way. I understand that you are in a challenging position as balancing the RCSD budget is a lose-lose situation. Students in the city of Rochester deserve an excellent education and the current funding formula combi combined with a pervasive culture of mediocrity at all levels of our school district makes that almost impossible. I am writing today to request that you do the following. Reject the budget that makes cuts to programs and staff that effectively serve the most vulnerable students. RIA needs to stay intact. The Young Mothers Program needs to be maintained. Social workers and special education teachers need to stay in the schools. Look for more creative options to balance the budget. The bus contracts are disgusting. The level of service that is provided is mediocre and accepted as such a great expense to our community. The construction budget is important, but again being shoveled out to companies that are doing substandard work. Look for new and innovative ways to lead our district through a mindset of excellence and collaboration. We need your leadership. Our community deserves excellence from our leaders. I have faith that things can change 
if you as our leaders can work with all stakeholders as partners rather, rather than adversaries. While I am no longer a district employee, I am deeply invested in the success of our community and their schools. I will keep doing what I can to drive our educational system towards excellence, and I'm always open to conversations and offer my support in a way that is requested. Thank you for all that you do to lead our schools and our community. The next speaker is Michael Weichenthal, a community member. I hope you are happy. You got the rest of New York State to pay for your budget problems that were created by your own ignorance and recklessness. I hope you look at management, administration, and the superintendent of schools for, dis for dismal because it is their fault with not spending within their budgets. There, shouldn't, there should be a lot of people fired over this, but it should not be the teachers. It amazes me how you can be rewarded for your ignorance and waste of taxpayer money. This money that you are receiving will undoubtedly go to lining the pockets of management. What a waste of good money from the New York State taxpayer to correct a problem created by ignorant and irresponsible people. Despicable. Muted. Thank you. My apologies. Our next speaker is Sharon Brown, a community member, and her topic is restoring the Chief of Student Services position. Good evening. I first met Mrs. Ruth Turner about a year and a half ago. My nephew was killed shortly after coming home after school. At about 11 p.m. that night, Mrs. Turner came to the hospital and provided much needed support and grief counseling and represented the district so well. I was so impressed by her care and empathy for my family. She continued over the next couple of months to support our family by ensuring mental health supports were in place and that my other nieces and nephew were supported when they returned to school. I later became a part of her district community engagement team for school climate. She pours all of her energy to improve things for our students. She is relentless and determined to help black and brown children succeed. I need our community. I need and our community needs more Mrs. Turner. Please reconsider your decision for the sake of our students. The next speaker is Charles Cantor, a community member. My name is Charles Cantor and I'm a retired clinical psychologist in the Rochester area. After working as a psychotherapist and mental health administrator for over 40 years, I retired in the fall of 2016. As I put together my post-retirement life, I got introduced to Rochester International Academy, RIA, about four years ago when Mary Andrikolich Montesano, the principal of RIA, asked our interfaith group, the Commission on Jewish Muslim Understanding, to contribute to the school's annual Thanksgiving dinner. She came to our group and described the mission of the school, and we enthusiastically br brought the turkeys for the dinner and have done so for the last several years. I decided at that time to call to volunteer at the school. Mary had encouraged all of us to come visit and noted that these kids, many of whom were just acquiring some English, were also kids who had faced trauma as refugees very early in their lives. She knew that any contact with folks from the Rochester culture was good for these kids' sense of involvement and belonging. But she also knew that when these kids had been split up from their neighborhood schools, they were likely to be marginalized and their self-esteem already compromised by trauma damaged further. For the last three years, I have volunteered to read to first and second graders and to help out the teachers in other ways as well. I have worked mainly with Miss Elizabeth Eddy, first grade, and Miss Patricia Sheehan, second grade, and cannot praise them enough for their competence, sensitivity, and empathy. I also regard these children as enthusiastic learners. My usual time to start with kids coincide, coincided with the end of recess time. One day, Many of the kids were drawing, playing games, and a few playing tag. But over in one corner, two first graders were teaching one to float one of the other, one of the float teachers, sorry. Their teachers, their teacher was multilingual, but he was now the student as his first graders taught him Arabic. On another day, three girls during the same recess period asked if I could help them with division. They had not really started learning that yet, but were curious and wanted to learn and during playtime, 
That is the atmosphere at Rio. I've seen kids struggle with English, but continue to work hard to learn. This has paid off in clear progress during the school year. I've seen kids in class representing seven countries and five languages other than English. Learn together, sing together, dance together, and make friends together. They clearly represent the best of us. Breaking up this early transition program would not only be a disservice to the children, parents, and teachers of Rio, but also to the Rochester community. Please keep Rhea intact. Support this gem of a program. Our next comment comes from Bonnie Rubenstein, who is a community member, and her topic is regarding Rhea. I'm writing to you as a member of the Rhea Community Advisory Board and also as a professor and chair of the Counseling and Human Development Department at the Warner School of Education at the University of Rochester. In my role at Warner, I have, in coordination with Ruth Ruth Turner placed many practicum and internship graduate counseling students in clinical placement at RIA. As a professor, I have written and presented extensively on the correlation between social emotional learning and academic achievement and on the impact of grief and loss on children. This connection is well documented in the literature over the past decade. Students newly arrived in this country face not just the trauma of their move, but also the daunting challenge of their limited English language skills. The K through 12 transition program presently at RIA provides a trauma-free, safe environment which allows students to grow academically, socially, and emotionally. As a community board member, I have witnessed firsthand the positive results of RIA's holistic approach to helping our children. Although an international high school is an amazing idea, it should not replace our RIA transitional program. Thank you for your consideration in this salient matter. The next speaker is Rabbi Alan J. Katz, a community member. I'm writing this as a concerned member of the community who has served here for 34 years. Over that period, I've worked with many interfaith organizations as well as many educational institutions. When I first encountered Principal Mary Andrikolich Montesano, and the Rochester International Academy, I was immediately impressed. Over the years, we have sent visitors from other countries, both educators and people who work with immigrants and refugees all over the world. They have nothing but glowing appreciation of the magnificent work being done to educate these children. Visiting the classrooms has demonstrated the magic that can be done for all ages to educate them and acculturate them. Recognizing their backgrounds with respect and appreciation lets them feel more secure in this new environment. I hope that the school board will see the benefit this school brings to the students, their families, and, their, and the greater community. It would be a shame to lose such a successful program. Our next comment comes from Mike Kniff, who is a community member, and his topic is Rhea. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, Please consider this letter of concern by our organization over the disbanding of some class levels from Rochester International Academy. RIA has been an effective program that has drawn attention from other educational programs around the country and has helped our refugee students succeed. The effectiveness of the program is important from two aspects. One, it provides refugee families with one central location for their children. Remember that we are talking about families from other cultures who are totally unfamiliar with our educational system, and therefore parents are unable to react and be involved. RIA takes this into consideration and is especially adapted to involve parents whenever appropriate and possible. Two, refugee families tend to be large and it is especially helpful to younger siblings to have older brothers and sisters in the same environment for mutual support guidance and compassion. The older siblings are able to serve as guardians as well as intermediary with family, parents through the education experience. Having one location and environment to operate under, RIA makes this experience far better, both for the family and for staff. I encourage you not to reshuffle any part of RIA. Let's not try to fix something that is not broken. Any short-term cost savings perceived will be larger expenses that have to be fixed later. Our next speaker is George S. Kornfeld, a community member. I am a community member who is concerned about the closing of RIA. 
I know that making cuts is very difficult, and I know that you are trying to balance the needs of all students. Please consider the work that Rhea has done to integrate immigrants and educate them in a supportive and nurturing environment. The next comment from, comes from Arshad Rahman, a community member regarding Rhea. Dear Mr. R White, my name is Arshad Rahman. I am currently a professor of pediatrics and pharmacology and physiology at the University of Rochester Medical Center. I am also the chairperson of the Commission on Jewish Muslim Understanding of Rochester. I am writing this letter on behalf of CJMU to express support for the continuation of the K through five grades at the Rochester International Academy. CJMU is an interfaith group that has existed for over 20 years with a strong commitment to developing a deeper understanding of our respective religions, along with our histories, interests, and the many cultures in which Jews and Muslims coexist now and in the past. Together, we are committed to a future of peace built upon the strong moral values that our religious traditions decree for the well-being of all people. Indeed, our unyielding dedication to personal and collective well-being calls us to speak out on issues that are an affront to the fundamental values, laws, and morals that we share as Americans. CJMU has been a strong supporter of the RIA school and recognizes the important work it has been doing to provide a place of learning, comfort, and acceptance for refugee children, many of whom experienced unspeakable trauma at a very early stage in life. RIA not only operates as a supportive environment and resources for their transition, learning, and growth, but also keeps them from being marginalized and falling through the cracks, especially in places with little understanding of cultural sensitivity and acceptance. For the past several years, CJMU has been assisting RIA through volunteer activities and providing turkeys for the school's annual Thanksgiving dinner. CJMU's partnership with RIA began about four years ago when Mary Anderlarch Montesano, the principal of RIA, visited our school, visited and spoke with CJMU about the mission of the school and the programs it offers to refugee children. Mary's sincerity, passion, and empathy for these children struck a chord with the CJMU members. Subsequently, our members began volunteering at RIA and CJMU pledged to provide turkeys for Thanksgiving dinner each year. Our members described their experience of volunteering for RIA as both fulfilling and inspiring. Considering the life-changing impact of RIA on these vulnerable children, the need to continue this program cannot be emphasized enough. The RIA represents the true spirit of Rochester's generosity and acceptance, and no reason can justify halting this program. CJMU requests the Board of the City of Rochester to make every effort to ensure the continuation of the early transition program. Interrupting the program would not only be a disservice to the children, parents, and teachers of RIA, but it is also contrary to the Rochester's longstanding tradition of embracing, protecting, and supporting those seeking a new home and yearning to breathe free. My best regards. Our next comment comes from Mary Jane Curry, a community member. I appreciate this opportunity to provide my thoughts on the proposed re reduction in scope of the, of the services of Rochester International Academy. I have been proud to serve on the advisory board of this program since its inception in 2011. Some of my research has focused on refugee student education, which equips me to support the highly successful approach that RIA takes towards serving refugee and migrant populations. In fact, RIA has become a national model because it works to support some of our most vulnerable students. Refugee students often arrive in Rochester with severe and often undiagnosed health issues, including post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition, those who have spent their young lives in refugee camps have often been denied access to formal education structures that and may not be illiterate in their home or local language or in any language. Therefore, they need to, to learn not only at English and academic content, but also how to engage with the customs of Western schooling and deal with poverty and health issues. The dedication and support of RIA staff to students and their families cannot be underestimated. 
They go above and beyond to create a safe and welcoming community for refugee students and their families, supporting their return to health and their integration into the community. As a result, WIA has an impressive rate of graduation and sending its students on to higher education, both at two and four year institutions. The students who would be removed from the lower grades of RIA services are not to be put in the same category as other immigrant English language learners. They need more specific tailored services that take into account the adversity they have experienced. Although the RCSD has an experienced and dedicated group of teachers of English to speakers of other languages, ESO, I know from experience from, through a five-year US Department of Education grant on teacher prepare, preparation that I held from 2012 to 2017 that most of these ESL teachers have not received specific training in working with refugee students. Moreover, the state's requirements for students to be moved into mainstream content classes mean that these students are more likely to drop out than even other ELLs, which is already a group at risk because mainstream teachers have even less preparation to serve refugee students. In sum, I make a heartfelt plea for RIA to be preserved as a successful program it has become in the past decade. Our next comment comes from Andriana Ongoiba, who is a community member, and her comments are regarding RIA. I am writing on behalf of Refugees Helping Refugees in support of Rochester International Academy and its entire transitional K through 12 educational program. Refugees Helping Refugees is a not-for-profit community-based organization dedicated to the growth, self-determination, and self-reliance of refugee communities in Rochester and Monroe County, New York. We provide comprehensive social services, including English classes, case management, health education, and work experience training to refugees of all backgrounds. By providing these services and engaging in the community, we aim to create an inclusive environment where refugees are heard and respected and can live full lives. Through active participation, members of the refugee community develop essential skills, build confidence and gain independence. RHR is the only refugee-led, refugee-serving organization in our region. A majority of our board and staff are of refugee background and our commitment to refugee leadership is a core principle that informs everything we do. RHR shares a close relationship with RIA and that we work with the same families. Many of our clients at RHR are the parents of students at RIA. While we assist with the parents, RIA provides support for the kids. We place our full trust in RIA and are reassured knowing that RIA gives its full attention to all refugee youth. In one past summer, RHR ran its youth program at RIA where it was able to provide all of the resources necessary for the program. Through our interactions with RIA, we have found that the students enjoy a multicultural aspect of the school and have found cultural affirmation there. One student, for example, was appreciative of the inclusion of African drumming in the program. Another student was pleased to learn that she could keep her Muslim faith as well as her college education and that she could be more than what her culture expected her to be. While RIA strives to provide English instruction to all English language learners, it also always takes into account the diversity of its student body and each student's unique cultural background. Another aspect that should be noted about RIA is the quality of the faculty and staff. We have found that an impressive number of students felt that RIA was their home. Many felt the principal deeply cared for them and prioritized their well-being and saw the teachers there like their second parents. This is likely due to the fact that many of the staff at RIA are of refugee or immigrant background. They understand on a personal level the challenges and emotions their students experience as they're adjusting to their new life in an entirely different country and culture. For the students, seeing someone who is similar to them in a position of success is both reassuring and inspiring. Students can comfortably approach their teachers for help and realize that they can achieve success like their teachers as well. RIA has a given track record of success and we believe that this is due to strong foundation and mission to work with all refugees right, where they arrive, right when they arrive. The school makes sure that not a single refugee youth feels alone in their struggles. 
Each student has both their instructors and peers who share similar experiences and are ready to help. With a model program already set in place, RIA should remain and continue to operate in its entirety for the sake of the currently attending students and future incoming students. RHR stands with RIA in that no cuts should be made whatsoever to its K through 12 transitional program. The next speaker is Jim Morris, a community member. A few weeks ago, Catholic Family Center and other community partners reached out to you to implore the district not to close the Rochester International Academy. At the time, the board stated that this was not in the plans. It is with great disappointment that we, now, that we have now heard that those plans have changed. We at Catholic Family Center have long worked closely with the Rochester City School District in pursuit of creating the best possible educational experience for refugees and other new Americans entering our community. For myself, I remember the days before RIA became a reality and so can attest to the tremendous difference I have seen in the experience of refugee kids and parents between those days and now. Simply put, RIA has been a miracle, a shining example of what dedicated educators and visionary administrators could accomplish together with community advocates. Its success cannot be argued. It is a star within the district and a model for the state and the country. It is inconceivable that this well-established success would be sacrificed to budget improvements. We implore the board to keep their previous promise and leave RIA intact so that all new American children K through 12 have the opportunity to flourish and grow in the school district. The transitional approach and model created under the leadership of Mary Andrukolich Montesano Diaz is proven and should not be dismantled. Let us continue to keep our promise to this community and give this critical educational support to some of our most vulnerable students in the Rochester community. Our next speaker is Ellen Smith. She is a community member and her comments are regarding RIA. Keeping Our Promise Rochester is a program of 200 dedicated volunteers who have been working since April 2014, helping to resettle Afghan, Iraqi, and Kurdish wartime allied families who arrived to Rochester under the Special Immigrant Visa Program. As administered under the Defense Authorization Act, these families, called SIVS, offered faithful and valuable services as interpreters and support personnel for our US military in a war zone. Each family has been targeted by the Taliban or ISIL for a gruesome death. Each family has experienced some wartime trauma, which then permitted them to come to the safety of our country. The process to get here takes at least four years. Rochester is one of 25 cities chosen by the US State Department for SIV resettlement. Rochester is only one of three cities in the state of New York for SIV re resettlement. The other two cities are Buffalo and Albany. We currently resettle 28% of the New York SIV population here in Rochester. Our organization promotes Rochester in large part because of RIA. We know that the staff of RIA has the understanding, patience, and diligence to help these children. None of these children speak English. They do not share the same alphabet. Each has experienced wartime trauma. RIA is a game changer in educating these children and helping families as a whole successfully integrating into the Rochester community. I am, a con I am in constant contact with SIV families from around the US and I frequently listen to stories of families struggling in other cities. Many ask, beg to move to Rochester. I see how well the families do here. Part of their healing process and coping with post-traumatic stress is knowing that their children will be okay and that they are safe. This is what Rhea gives to our families. We even have Rhea featured in our video clip for resettlement. Rochester has chosen to welcome refugee and SIV families into this community, and RIA is an essential part of their successful resettlement. RIA is a model that should be emulated in this community and not closed to the detriment of our SIVs and refugees who we, as a community, have chosen to welcome to Rochester. 
Our next speaker is Allison Howard, a community member. My name is Allison Howard, and I'm a community member as well as partner with RIA as a medical social worker at the Center for Refugee Health Doctor's Office. As a partner for the past five years, I have developed a close relationship with administrators, staff members, and students and families within the Rochester International Academy, RIA family. And, cannot, and can personally and professionally attest to the devastation that would be caused by eliminating this school for, for one of the most vulnerable populations within our Rochester community. Our clinic sees all new refugees, the entire family network who come into the country and the majority of school aged children live in Rochester, attend RIA. These children are coming from war-torn countries and refugee camps and arrive in the US with uncertainty, unlimited resources, language barriers, and mental health con conditions, including PTSD, anxiety, depression, and adjustment disorders, and low education literacy. RIA is a source of stability and comfort for children and does not only provide a comprehensive education, but support staff and community environment where children grow and thrive, not only academically, but also psychologically. Many of the students who attend RIA are also patients in the clinic and are extremely well adjusted and have high attendance rates and involvement in school culture life. RIA's school, RIA school environment and culture goes above and beyond to not only meet the needs of the students within the walls of the classroom, but also connects with families and provides them with an abundance of support, including food resources, medical supports, counseling, et cetera, outside of school as well. There are school advocates or staff members who speak multiple languages, who have made special trips to families' homes for meetings, who have brought students to medical appointments and helped with language or interpretation, and connected with families in an intimate way because they have knowledge and familiarity with the culture. Additionally, the school has exceptional resources for English as new learners and young students who are learning English for the first time. Many students who have transitioned out of RIA have also struggled immensely with the transition and have experienced bullying and persecution and seek assistance or, or support with wanting to return back to RIA. For students who are new to the country and experiencing so much transition and barriers, it is essential that they feel safe and comfortable at school. Having students around them that share the same culture and have similar struggles is integral to feeling comfortable and safe and thus allowing them to learn. We are all aware that the RCSD ex is experiencing a huge budget crisis and there are changes and program cuts that need to be made. However, eliminating RIA or reducing the capacity is not the solution for our most vulnerable students. Thank you for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Sue Orico Saita. She's a staff member and her topic is the Young Mothers Program. I began teaching at the Young Mothers Program in September of 1996 at the request of Mary Sharipar, who was the Director of Career and Technical Education at the same time. She suggested that I go to YMP as I was a new mom and would do well to relate with the students. I would like to give an overview of my 20 plus years at YMP. Historically, the Young Mothers Program began with a small staff in a bowling alley in 1969 as the need in the community grew to continuously educate this population of young women, the YMP moved again to the basement of a church and finally in 1990 it was relocated to 30 Hart Street where it still can still be found today. The Young Mothers Program has a foundation of community resources that have supported the Rochester City School District and the students that district serves. I would like to identify some of these resources. RAMP, Rochester Adolescent Maternity Program in conjunction with Strong Memorial and Highland Hospitals, YWCA, Pregnant and Parenting Teens, Women, Infant and Children, St. John Fisher, Nazareth College of Nursing, University of Rochester, Junior Achievement, Rochester Public Library, Dairy Council of Rochester, which is under Cornell U University, the American Red Cross, Mil um, Milita House, Downtown United Presbyterian Church. When I began at the Young Mothers Program, the program educated only pregnant and parenting teens. Many of these students came to the program through referrals from their home schools for health and safety reasons. 
Community advocates such as RAMP, family members, the church, community of Rochester, and friends that have been previous students. Word of mouth. This program is known throughout the Rochester area and Monroe County. As a teacher in this program and speaking for other coworkers, these young women were in our hearts, our heads, and be became discussion in our families. We have to help these ladies continue their education during their pregnancy, and in some very sad cases, miscarriages, stillborn, and even death of their children through SIDS, Southern, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Many of these young mothers had the support of their families, but others did not, and YMP became their family a safe haven, a place to discuss their futures, their classes, their needs, and even the freedom to make bathroom visits without being questioned as is normal in a comprehensive homeschool. They were provided a support system, understanding people to talk and encourage them to continue their education, not only for themselves, but for the future of their child. Before Universal Pre-K was a program, provided to families, we had students reading to their children in the daycare that was housed at Hart Street. The importance of how to hold your baby with the book in hand and to read to them, even reading to their unborn child during pregnancy. Through the Rochester Public Library program, each student made books for their child and were gifted with new board books for their future child. Educating both the mom and the child are strongly supported as the child most likely would become a Rochester City School District student, and in many cases, both the mom and child were students of the RCSD simultaneously. These young ladies developed female friends. As silly as this may seem, many of the students confided they never had female friends. The new moms would take their children out together to parks, the zoo, and even our libraries. Please reevaluate the necessary budget cuts and continue the strong positive educational opportunity for students at the Young Mothers Academy and consequently the Rochester City School District. Thank you. The next speaker is Tucker Rudderman, a staff member. As an RCSD elementary teacher and a city resident, I am distressed at the possibility of deep cuts of special education teachers general education teachers, and critical support staff such as social workers in the proposed budget discussions. As we seek as a community to remedy the devastating effects of economic violence, structural racism, and generational injustice, we must recognize that attempting to slash our way clear will only deepen the damage to our most vulnerable families and their children. I urge you to seek creative solutions to the funding crisis that do not worsen the problem. This, after all, is your charge to lead the district in the best interest of children, families, and the community to which they belong. Our next speaker is Robert Hoos. He is a staff member, and his topic is the City School District 2020-21 budget. Please reconsider your draft budget. Our students and staff have already had a difficult year with the mid-year layoffs, and this proposed budget will cause more harm. When Superintendent Dade came to our district, he said that he wanted to change the narrative of Rochester City School District. Cutting teachers and severely reducing our programs is not a new narrative. This is a recurrent part of the narrative of the Rochester City School District. It is a cycle that happens too frequently in our district, and it is incredibly destructive. When Superintendent Dade found out that the district was in financial trouble, he stressed that he wanted to keep the impact as far from the classroom as possible. Cutting teachers is not making cuts far from the classroom. It is the classroom. Please consider finding the money to keep teachers and staff that work directly with students by reducing expenditures in other areas. Part of the rationale for the reductions has been failing student, falling student enrollment. This would leave empty space within our schools. One thing that could be considered to save money is decentralizing the functions provided at central office and placing those functions in space available at schools. Many superintendents have offices that are physically connected to the schools where their students learn. I think it would be amazing to have students see the work 
that the superintendent and central office provides for them in their schools and for their superintendent and board to be present in the daily learning of students. Our students are our top priority. Providing them with consistency in classroom teacher presence and access to arts in schools is critical to their success. Superintendent Dade has called our district a family. Please find a better way to meet our fiscal needs than sacrificing family members. Our next speaker is Nicole Flores, a staff member, and she is writing in regards to RIA. It is currently 1.54 a.m. and this is the second night in a row that I have stared at my computer and have tried to wrap my mind around what was proposed Thursday night to the Board of Education. Trying to find the words to say, plead or reason with a decision that could make anyone understand how this will impact and devastate the little ones I see day to day. Little ones I see more than my own family, which I feel isn't even appropriate to say because these teachers and students have become my family. For the last six years, I have watched students flourish from a program, a program I knew little about until my principal, Mary Andrew College Diaz, pulled me aside one summer afternoon in between summer school lessons and August Regents exams. I didn't even know what it meant yet to teach an ENL student. Since then, I knew it was where I wanted to be. Here's why. My first year, 2014, student A started in my class as a third grader reading at AA in September. By January, student A was an A. By June, he was an E. Take into consideration he could not formulate English words, write on paper, and came from a war-torn country with scars and stories beyond my life's existence. Second year, 2015. Student R started in my class as a fourth grader learning at an AA. He finished the school year reading at a B. What happened in between was frequent absences due to extensive surgeries to correct his vision, and an eye ailment from the horrors of war. He also would tell of his life before Rhea and how he watched his father and other men in his village being marched to the village circle and shot in front of the families. He told my co-teacher and me this, and as we held back tears, he said it as if it was an everyday occurrence from a nine-year-old to witness. Third year, 2016. Student D started in my class reading at a B and had a N N-Y-S-I-T-E-L-L score of zero. She was quiet and scared. She wouldn't speak in fear of being wrong and was trying to figure out her role as a girl in the classroom. Yes, a girl in the classroom. She loved school. I couldn't keep her busy enough. She was always asking for more. And by the end of the year, she was reading at an M and scored an 193 on her N-Y-S-I-T-E-L-L. She went from never being in the classroom or even near school to almost grade level. Now, see, now she messages me about becoming a doctor. Fourth year, 2017. Student K started in my class reading at a D. She finished the year at a level Q. Within a year, her NYELSAT went from a zero to a 197. What the reading level doesn't show is the amount of hugs and tears we shared through her struggles. The reading score doesn't show under the uniform and hijab scars left from sharp shrapnel across her entire body. She sees them every day, and every day it reminds her that she needed Rhea, much like next year's students will need Rhea. Fifth year, 2019. Student M is a child who started reading at a B. This child finished the year reading at a P. This child scored a zero on her N-Y-S-I-T-E-L-L, -L, and in a year, she was able to score a 195. The data doesn't show that she's one of 10 children. She sometimes comes to school falling asleep in class, because she helped mom with the baby at night. She had to complete her duties at home that were expected of her, and sometimes her homework came last, but she didn't give up and her smile never stopped. Sixth year, 2019. Now I have a student E who started as, a, as an E. As of January, that student is reading at a Q. This particular student is one who looks like she is not paying attention. She looks confused, but when you call on her and give her the proper response time, she always answers correctly. Will she take that chance in a school that she has not built that confidence in yet? Where she doesn't have students who understand she used to live in a hut with a dirt floor? Those are only six students, six out of the many I have taught and the many that the K through five team has taught. The data is there. I have more if you would like my spreadsheet because, Rhea, because at RIA that is the expectation. 
You need to understand your students. You need to know their needs, but the data isn't the best part. The best part of what I do is that six years later, I hear from students and their success. I hear from students and their success stories. The teachers that they miss and how they feel isn't the same anywhere else. I still visit homes of the students and listen to how they are doing or what their older siblings have done since. I still hear from those students on social media that they miss me. It doesn't matter if it is six years or one, they talk about admissions for college and getting a job so they can help their Rochester community in return. Parents are still thanking me for giving their children opportunities and not giving up on them. It wasn't just me though, it was all of Rhea. It was the teachers, the support of administration, the social workers, and everyone who comes together as a team to help these families. So now I ask, how do I explain this to them? How do I tell these families of current students that the community that has brought them in, told them it would be safe, and told them they would get equal access to education, that it is all changing? What do I tell students who are doing their part in the community and the classroom? They show you in their data, state test scores, NYE, SLAT, ORRs, those scores don't tell their stories. Those don't tell what they have experienced or where they came from and what they have overcome. You see it as a student 890 number. I see them for their day-to-day -day struggles and successes. They are showing progress and working hard despite coming from, a tent, from tent cities, war, places that didn't want them or coming in pieces or parts of a family that is left from the journey along the way. Honestly, why do I have to tell them? Why are they hearing it in English in a robocall? The student that not only keeps her shoes on, but has started to talk in a classroom setting and has learned how to read and write complete sentences is the one who will be translating that call for her parents. Is this how they will be supported in their new school? I'm not making this choice. I'm not punishing my students. Rochester City School District website has a banner on the homepage. Every student by face and name, every class, every school, every classroom to and through graduation. I ask if this is how you see my elementary classes. Do you see their faces as you make this decision? Actually, you do, because their faces are on the front page of the RCSD website, the home page. Do you see their names? Do you see them in the classroom that they are being successful in as this decision is being voted on? What would you say if this was your child? I have a kindergartner and I don't think I would have the words to tell him there isn't money to pay for his class anymore. I asked him today during dinner what he would say to his teacher if she told him he would have to go to a new school because there wasn't money to pay for his classroom. His response, how much do you need? Can I give them my piggy bank? Thankfully, I don't have to relay that message to him and neither does his teacher. I hope you do not give us the obligation to be the ones that have to deliver that message to our students. My sincerest regards, Nicole Flores, elementary ENL teacher at Rochester International Academy. Our next speaker is Lauren Block. She's a staff member and her topic is RIA. To the Rochester City School District Board, Edu Board of Education for consideration at the April 2nd board hearing. As we have learned from good old Maslow, if a child's most fundamental needs are not met, they are not able to meet their full potential. Neuroscience also shows that a sense of belonging is a prerequisite for learning. Studies have shown that sense of belonging is one of the most important activators of a child's engagement in learning. Everything about the activating of a child's cognitive skill begins with activating their social connectedness, Dr. Pamela Cantor. At RIA, this is what we do. We are family. At RIA, every staff member goes above and beyond to ensure that our students and families' basic psychological needs are being met and that students feel safe, nurtured, and have a strong sense of belonging. After all of the trauma students have faced in their home countries, compounded by the resettlement process and the connected stressors of isolation, poverty, and acculturation, they need a social and emotional learning and support that RIA provides. The newcomer program at RIA was designed to provide sheltered instruction and English language supports to students I'm sorry.
The newcomer program at RIA was designed to provide sheltered instruction and English language support to students with interrupted or limited formal education and to teach the hidden curriculum of how to navigate the US school system and everyday life in a new country. After studying the principles of social emotional learning and trauma informed practices, through the Refugee Educator Foundations course at the Cary Institute for Global Good and discussing and evaluating several model programs, I can say that the program at RIA is unparalleled in meeting the success of a student's physical, emotional, mental, environmental, social, intellectual, spiritual, and even financial and occupational needs. This is why RIA has been nationally recognized as a school of opportunity, gold medal winner, and featured by the United Nations for giving refugee students a chance at a better future. Simply put, there is no other school or program in our district that can give the K-12 refugee and newcomer student of the Rochester equal opportunities to learn, engage, and thrive. And therefore, as stated in the RCSD mission, provide all students equitable access to a high quality education and graduate students who are prepared to become productive members of society. Do not take away this bright spot in our district and community by cutting grades K through five and capping numbers for grades six through 12 which will close RIA's doors to newcomer students that it was designed to welcome into the RCSD family. Hashtag necessary K-12. The next speaker is Laura G. Burgash, a staff member speaking about RIA. To the Rochester City School District Board of Education, I am writing this letter to you today to shine light on the importance of Rochester International Academy to its families, staff, but most importantly, its students. This is why it would not benefit this population to remove grades K through five from RIA. This school has provided both my brother, me and my family many opportunities that have benefited or success. Five years ago, a week from today, my brother came home to America as a 60 pound 14 year old boy who knew no English and was illiterate in his native language, Bulgarian. Though my parents contacted our local school district time and time again and gave them resource after resource, they stood unknowing what to do. Their suggestion was to have Mikhail, my brother, wait until the fall to start school. When my parents stood up for what was right, they offered him two hours of school each day. Again, when my parents stood up for what was right for Mikhail's education, they put him in a 15 to one classroom without any testing prior. This district cannot be to blame because they didn't know what to do. That's when a family friend told us about Rhea. Life would never be the same after this. After much contact with the amazing administration and counseling at the, and staff at Rhea, Mary Diaz, Mark Davis, and Jennifer Grimes, our home district finally agreed to send Mikhail to Rhea for the past four years so that he could earn a Regents diploma and graduate high school. Though when my, Mikhail first began at RIA, we did not know if this would be possible. As stated above, Mikhail did not know English and was illiterate in Bulgarian when he came to this country. When he began RIA in fall 2015, he had very few English language skills. His first SO teacher, Christina Pelletier, will tell you of his inability to even take a test in the classroom due to his PSD from his PTSD from his native country and the lack of education he had received there. By the end of his first year, he was staying in the classroom and he could have conversations using his English. In the past four years at RIA, I have watched my brother learn the English language, gain confidence in his ability to speak, read and write it, make friends, gain trust for teachers and feel supported. In addition, RIA has provided many parents with much needed support during trying times. For example, due to the emotional, physical and sexual abuse he endured, while in his Bulgarian orphanage, it has been difficult for Mikhail to trust others. 
The teachers and staff at RIA provided Mikhail with academic and emotional support on, the, on a daily basis. Many times Mikhail has gone during lunch to talk with John Hag, his former math teacher, because he feels supported and important when in his classroom. We all know that unfortunately it's not in every school that students make these connections with their teachers. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to watch Mikhail video chat his teachers due to the school closure and distance learning we are all experiencing. He was joyful and trusted them enough to show how he was feeling. In June, Mikhail will graduate with a Regents diploma and it could not have been possible without the existence of a school that specializes in newcomer ENL students, RIA. RIA has benefited my education. I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher, but after Mikkel came home, I decided to pursue ESSEL education. I attended Roberts Wesleyan College where I obtained my BS in ESSEL education. During my time in college, I completed both 50 observation hours and student teaching at RIA. I learned how to con connect with students from very diverse cultures, how to connect them with each other, how to honor students' roots in every lesson plan, how to create a meaningful lesson plan, how to differentiate a lesson plan for students who are, whose reading levels varied from a kindergarten to middle school level, and so much more. Under the leadership of my master teachers, Lisa Wat Watson and Christina Pelletier, I learned much more at RIA than I could ever have learning, learned from another school. RIA is specially designed for newcomer students who could not su be successful in other classrooms. This specially designed instruction sprinkled with a lot of love and emotional support does not happen in other schools. I teach in a rural district as a third grade teacher with the ENL cluster in my classroom. The skills I learned through my time at RIA and Mikhail's time at RIA, I use on a daily basis to support the needs of my students. Therefore, I am confident that without RIA, I, but especially my brother, would not have been successful. Please take this story and these words into deep consideration as you make your decisions regarding Rochester International Academy. I know that I speak on behalf of many students and families when I say that children may not reach their potential nor be supported if it were not for what happens on a daily basis inside the four walls of the Rochester International Academy. Our next speaker is Christina Pelletier, who is a staff member and will be discussing Ria. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Dade. My name is Christina Pelletier and I am an ESOL teacher at the Rochester International Academy. I wish I could be present to speak in person at tonight's meeting, like so many of us were on February 27th. It was at that meeting where President Van White said, and I quote, there is absolutely no initiative, policy, or intention to remove or close down RIA. All right, I am here to tell you, and Terry is here to tell you, that there is no intention. The majority of RIA staff members then waived their right to speak after he further commented, if you think you're going to convince us not to close down RIA, you are wasting your time as you are speaking to the choir. There is no intention to do that tonight or in the future. And yet here we are. Only five weeks later with the intention of cutting grades K through five and severely limiting enrollment for grades six through 12 next year. I am imploring you to vote no against this proposal which directly affects some of our student, our district's most vulnerable students, the refugee population. In the words of one of RIA's graduating seniors, taking RIA students from their home is like taking babies from their mothers. The negative impacts that cutting kids grades K through five would have on these newcomer students would be catastrophic, and even more so in these troubling times of pandemic school closures. Our community needs RIA as a transitional program for newly arrived students to the United States. The proposed enrollment of only 160 students for grades six through 12 does not allow for a transitional program. The enrollment would be full by September. To give you an example, I'm sorry, but the two minutes have expired. These will be submitted into the public record and posted online. Kalia. The next speaker is Jennifer Dale Sheehan, a staff member at RIA. 
My name is Jennifer Dale Sheehan and I'm a teacher at the Rochester International Academy. I'm currently the second grade teacher and before that I was the teacher for newcomers in third and fourth grade. The elementary program at RIA is absolutely necessary and I speak from experience. Having been a classroom teacher in area Monroe County schools for over 20 years, I can tell you that English language learners get lost in the shuffle unless they're in a program like the one RIA offers. When a teacher has a class of 25 students that includes one or two ELs, you direct your teaching to the majority of the class, that being the English speaking students. As a gen ed teacher, you assume that the SO teacher is taking care of the Ls. You will check in, partner with them with a night with, you will check in, partner them with a nice kid, but for the most part, you just hope they learn something. I'm not saying that all teachers would do this, but class sizes are big and teaching is demanding. You direct your teaching where it will do the most good. RIA is amazing because all the students are English language learners and the elementary teachers tailor their instruction to meet the needs of all the students. Individualizing instruction on a case-by-case -case basis. Before I worked at RIA, I had no idea what a SIFE was, a student with interrupted formal education. If I had gotten a SIFE before I taught at RIA, I'm not sure what I would have done, probably nothing academically challenging or academically respectful. Now I meet the needs of the student and I understand what a SIF is and what they need. Just to paint a clear picture, having students with no formal education can mean so many things. For example, a student just walks out of the classroom or rolls around on the floor or crawls into the teacher's lap because they, they don't know. Being at, at RIA, we start with compassion and love because we know that refugees and immigrants have a very different experience. The students at RIA have seen things that children should not see. They have enjoyed more than most adults. That's why RIA is special. The teachers understand that and they teach knowing that some students have seen horrible things like, a like family members killed. Another thing to consider, is that the timer? Yes. I'm sorry, we will post to the website. Our next speaker is Tina Bianchi. She is a staff member and her topic is RIA. Good evening board members and all those watching from home. I would like to begin my comments by thanking those of you who get it. I wanna thank those of you who have spoken out about the importance of Rochester International Academy. This letter is not really directed towards you. It's directed towards those who need a reminder about trust, trust. The dictionary will tell you that trust is a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. At a BOE meeting just a few short weeks ago, President White looked at our principal and our brave students and said, there is absolutely no initiative, policy, or intention to remove or close down RIA, all right? I am here to tell you, and Terry is here to tell you that there is no intention. If you think you're going to convince us not to close down RIA, you are wasting your time as you are speaking to the choir. There is no intention to do that, not tonight or the future. Now here we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Having to explain to our students why they can't trust the words of those who have been elected or hired to make the best decisions to educate every student who walks through our doors. Success must be measured beyond dollars. I, feel, I felt encouraged by our new superintendent when he came on board preaching the three rocks, unsurpassed collaboration, changing the narrative, and laser-like focus on teaching and learning. These three rocks were seen as, a vital, as vital to our success as a whole, to changing the face of our district and moving us forward as a family, in it together for the long haul. While it is important to remember that Superintendent Dade inherited the budget problem, it is counterintuitive to this educator to solve one fiasco by creating another worse fiasco. Cuts to the K through five level and restrictions that would limit or eliminate the ability to take newcomers would greatly diminish the likelihood of success for some of our most vulnerable learners. The rest will be posted to the web page. The next speaker is Emma Brinkman, a staff member. 
I'm writing with deep concerns over the proposed plan to shut down the K through five program at Rochester International Academy, the wonderful school at which I had the tremendous privilege and honor to teach for the last four years. As an elementary ENL teacher, I have worked with hundreds of students in the welcoming, nurturing environment that is RIA. Many of our students come to us with little to no prior formal education, and after a few years, our students are reading, writing, and speaking with courage. For these students, RIA is not only a safe place to learn and grow, it is an environment that takes many steps to ensure that immigrant and refugee students new to the US are given the resources needed to thrive throughout their long transition to living in a new country. Teachers at RIA utilize trauma-informed instruction protocols to support ELLs, many of whom have experienced deep trauma prior to coming to the United States. Furthermore, research shows that refugee and immigrant students living in poverty continue to experience traumatic events as they begin to acculturate to life in the US, such as poverty, language barriers, racism, xenophobia, and job insecurity. At RIA, we recognize these circumstances and provide support in the form of community outreach through our invaluable language coaches, clothing and other household items from our closet or clothing closet, direct support to families from our social worker, special events such as RIA Thanksgiving and communication to our families in their native languages. In order to create a positive learning environment for our students struggling to adjust to life in the new country, we, inc we incorporate social emotional learning and culturally responsive pedagogical approaches that bring students cultures and command values in the classroom. In my, in my classroom and in many others throughout the school, we hold key circles and practice mindfulness, teaching students brain-based brain science that helps them regulate emotions, ready their brains for learning and connect more deeply with peers. Is that the timer? Yes. Kalia, can you please tell me the name of the person's comments who you just read? That is Emma Brinkman. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Joanna Schuler. She is a staff member. And her comment is regarding the 2020-21 proposed budget and lead. I am contacting the City of Rochester City School District Board of Education in regards to the proposed budget for the academic school year 2020-2021. I understand the RCSD is facing a difficult time in its history. Over the years, the speech language department has developed programs in order to reach the needs of all RCSD students. The department has developed lead, steps, interact, and foundations. All of these programs are crucial to the development of the RCSD students in their academic careers. The Language Enrichment All Day LEAD is a K through two program to assist students who display a moderate to severe language disorder. Each LEAD classroom is comprised of a general education teacher and speech language pathologist. The speech language pathologist is present in the classroom all day working with not only students with a moderate to severe language disorder, but the general education students as well. The speak, speech language pathologist provides intensive language remediation and is embedded in all academic content areas. The students IEP goals are language and curriculum based for reading, math, writing, speaking and listening and or social emotional. The LEAD program incorporates evidence-based practice materials embedded into the curriculum. This program provides the opportunity for students to achieve the following skills. Organizational and formulation of verbal thoughts, following directions, phonological awareness, concept development, comprehension, grammar, critical thinking skills, answering questions, narrative skills, describing, social skills, problem solving, and vocabulary. All of these skills are imperative for a child to be successful in his or her academic career. The LEAD program allows for significant progress, not only with the student's language skills, but also with the student's carryover skills and generalization of their IEP goals. This will be posted to the website. Our next speaker is Regina Meyer, a staff member regarding budget concerns. 
Dear Board of Education and Superintendent Dade, I'm writing today to express my sincere concerns regarding the devastating cuts to the Rochester International Academy for this upcoming school year. RIA's program was initially started to give newcomer refugee and immigrant students a learning experience that is unique to their needs as they begin their education upon coming to America. Our vast school district has many schools that focus on specific and unique facets of education. Some on special education, arts integration, some on speech therapy, others on bilingual education for Spanish speaking students and some on expeditionary learning to name a few. One thing that was clearly missing was a program that focused completely on teaching our newcomer non-Spanish speaking ELL students based on their specific needs. This was why RIA was created. The journey to America is a trying and hard fought battle that our students, families have endured to give their children access to a safe, equal and superior education. The difference between our ELL students and our bilingual students is that American education is prepared for Spanish speaking students. Materials are often already translated in Spanish for students and their families by law. Our bilingual learners are set up for success based on this simple fact. For students whose first language is not English or Spanish, there are added challenges when coming to school in America. RIA is a program that focuses on this population of students that are often left behind. It is a program that ensures our ELL students are fully immersed in language acquisition during every part of their day, including during their time in elective classes. What is most special about our program at RIA is that our ELL students not only get a uniquely tailored education that fits their specific needs, but they also have the opportunity to be in class with students who are true peers. They are able to speak their first language to other students and staff members when needed to assist in their learning. It is a program where they're getting first language support, the same as our bilingual students. If you break down this program and scatter our students throughout the district, they will once again get lost in the system as they did prior to RIA being created. They will sit in classrooms quietly, listening to teachers teach the, teach the majority. They will only be able to receive specific ESO support for a short push, pull out or push in during the school day. By closing the elementary portion of RIA, you will be splitting up families over multiple schools, further lessening their support systems. Putting our students back to their home schools will eliminate their opportunities to thrive and as a result, force them to resort back to living in survival mode. I understand this is a budget deficit. I understand this budget deficit is dire and that we will all have to endure some loss as a result, but please consider other areas where we may be able to restructure in order to protect this necessary program that is so important to some of our most vulnerable students. Our next comment is from Mary under College Montesano Diaz. She is a staff at RIA. Dear RCSD board members, a little, a little, excuse me, a little over 30 days ago on February 27th, 2020, I stood at the board podium and told all of you and the numerous, that the numerous speakers that were in the audience who came to speak on behalf of RIA decided not to speak after hearing the statements made by President White and Superintendent Dade. President White stated, there is absolutely no initiative, policy, or intention to remove or close down RIA, all right? Superintendent Dade sta stated, I just wanna reiterate President White's sentiment. I hate when things that are said get taken out of context. I wanna say it so abundantly clear so that it gets printed correctly. There is no proposal to close RIA for next year. Please keep in mind that the budget situation was the same as it is now, and yet we're still told that there was no intent for removal or closure. With that being said, please imagine the shock, concern, and anger that the entire RIA community is feeling right now. I believe that the excuse is going to be a play on words, closed and removed compared to reduction. However, the current proposal of eliminating the K through five part of RIA is closing a part of RIA and reducing the number of students that can enroll in the six through 12 part of RIA is also removing the actual intent of RIA. I am sure that Ms. Ramos Lopez, that's me, was not able to read the above that is written in Arabic. She is correct. There was a statement there in Arabic and I did not try to read it because I can't. And I'm sure that she had to skip over it. 
She's right. And had to continue with this letter in English. This is exactly what happens in our other schools at no fault of their own. Just like the teachers in the schools, Ms. Ramos Lopez does not have the time to find an interpreter to assist with this letter, which represents our students. She does not have the capacity to fully help all of you understand what was written, and she is not fully prepared to differentiate this meeting as she is bound by time and the goals of the meeting. This is exactly what the teachers and other schools face, and again, at no fault of their own, as they still have full classes of students. That is exactly why RIA was created as a transitional program 10 years ago. A transitional program that has the capacity to streamline resources, differentiate materials, meet the instructional needs of students, and fully prepare the staff to serve our most vulnerable students. Newcomer students who speak low incident languages, most from, from refugee camps, all from war-torn countries, most without formal education, most without zero English proficiency, and all who need an extremely trauma-free environment. President White, Vice President Elliott, and Commissioner Powell, all of you were on the board 10 years ago and voted yes to the creation of RIA. Since that time, RIA has become the most decorated program and school in our district. We are the only school and program that has serviced students from suburban districts like Fairport, Webster, and Newark, and our data has shown that RIA is serving with the intent that it was created to do. I have kept my promise to take care of our most vulnerable babies. I know the time has run out, so I'm going to skip to the final paragraph. Please vote no on the RIA proposal as the needs is the same as it was 10 years ago for all newcomer students in grades K through 12. In fact, the need is even greater in this very specific time that we are living in. The travel ban, high levels of xenophobia, COVID-19, and our current federal government leadership has created enhanced fear amongst our specific student population at this time. On behalf of my entire RIA community, but most importantly, our students that we currently serve and should serve in the future, please vote no. Our next speaker is Annie Tran Flesch, a staff member speaking about RIA. Good evening, board members. My name is Annie Tran Flesch, and I am a math teacher and registrar at the Rochester International Academy. This is my 10th year in the district and my ninth year at RIA. I proudly stood in front of you with all my administrators, colleagues, and community members on February 27th with words prepared to share with you about how necessary RIA is. Board President Van White and Superintendent Dade confidently made us all believe that there was no plan in place to close RIA. A huge sigh of relief and happy tears were felt in that room and in the community when we heard those words and song lyrics from Superintendent Dade. However, on March 26th, you went back on your word and erupted a storm of chaos and heartache in our lives. RIA is absolutely necessary. RIA as a K through 12 transitional program is essential for the district to support the unique needs of newcomer students arriving in the States. Learning a brand new language and a completely new way of life is definitely not easy, but RIA makes it easier for English language learners. We provide our students with sheltered instruction to build a safe and positive learning environment where they feel empowered to learn. We help our students build foundational skills in all content areas so that they can flourish and feel confident in their learning. We support their social and emotional needs and celebrate their diversity in a time where this country is so divided. I'm so proud to be a part of a school community that stands united together. Acceptance, Tolerance, respect, and a true sense of family can be felt in every classroom and can be heard in every hallway conversation among our students from all around the world. RIA is a beacon of hope in Rochester for so many students and their families. It is a program that has propelled refugees and immigrants to bre break the glass ceiling and to rise up confidently. We need RIA. The district needs RIA. The city of Rochester needs RIA. You have all supported us for nine years now. You have seen the achievements our students have made and continue to make. You witnessed the wonderful things we do in our school. Please keep the momentum going. Please do not vote to close RIA. RIA is necessary. Thank you so much for your time. Our next speaker is Alicia Castellón. She is a staff member and her topic is RIA. My name is Alicia Castellón and I am a kindergarten teacher at RIA and a 20-year RCSD veteran teacher. 
I am writing you today to impress upon you the necessity and importance of RIA. I will start by saying that I taught 11 years at General Otis Number 30 School. During the end of my time there, the refugee and Im immigrant population were beginning to arrive from countries in Africa. The ENL teacher who would come to my kindergarten room with children from Burundi, ranging from first to sixth grade, just so they could get the basics of calendar, weather, and sing songs. The students loved this time. She told them that they were, they were coming to help kindergarten so that they didn't feel ashamed. She knew what they needed. The general education teachers came to me for work that was more on the newcomer's grade level, not because they couldn't teach them, but that they were working on, but what they were working on in class was so many grade levels above what the children needed. Most newcomer children started, most newcomer children need to start at the beginning of learning with a brand new alphabet and number system. This is not what newcomers deserve. They deserve the time, attention, and patience that we provide at RIA to start their American education. I am a different kind of teacher now. Before I worked at RIA, I would have never understood how to service a few newcomer students in my general education room of 21. It's like asking a fifth grade teacher to suddenly teach kindergarten or speech teacher to provide OT without the necessary training. RIA is the, late, the least restrictive environment for newcomers to start. It is a disservice to expect that they will learn to the best of their ability otherwise. RIA is needed because we have the time to make all children who are in their silent period feel comfortable enough to speak. Our time is up with this one, but it will be posted. The next speaker is Lisa Watson, a staff member speaking about RIA. My name is Lisa Watson. This is my seventh year as a third and fourth, fourth grade teacher at Rochester International Academy. The staff and students at RIA have been an extension of my family for the past several years and I couldn't be more grateful. Prior to RIA, I taught for five years at Nathaniel Rochester Community School with talented teachers and supportive administration. The RCSD is a second home to me. As NRCS and Wilson are my alma maters. I'm a proud gra graduate of the city school district and absolutely love my students as they are my own. Recently, I have become disheartened over what I have always defended, stood up for and called my family. Here we are one month past when President, White, when President Van White stated, RIA is not closing. The confirmation of that statement by Superintendent Dade drew cheers from students and staff alike who attended, the, who attended that board meeting on February 27th. A new proposal that states RIA K through five is to close its doors upon the completion of this school year has been put on the table one month past the date you said in a public forum that RIA will not close. I can predict your, rebut re your rebuttal. It's not closing, it's being reconfigured into a new school. Unacceptable. To write a proposal to remove a transition program from, for newcomers to America tells me that you don't understand what RIA is for. K through five, or that maybe you are ignorant to the needs of refugees. I don't say that to be disrespectful, however, I need you to understand both points fully as you take this proposal into consideration. Only through education will ignorance be diminished in order to better serve our students. Rochester International Academy is a transition program for students who are newly arrived to the city of Rochester. Many of these students have limited education, no education or interrupted education due to circumstances in their own countries beyond their control. They have been placed at RIA based on data that shows they are not academically ready for classroom of English speakers. That is the timer. Our final comment comes from Carrie Heyman, a staff member, and her topic is RIA. The Rochester International Academy is a lesson for all for us all in how to see ourselves in the other. As you render the important decision of how RIA should operate in the 2021 school year, please consider the following questions. What would you want your beginning experience to be as a student in a foreign country? Would you seek to attend the same school as your brothers and sisters? Would you appreciate a cohesive delivery of instruction in every subject? 
Would you desire a principal and teachers who understood your specific needs as a newcomer to the language, culture, and systems of a new country? Would you want language coaches to help you comprehend instruction and assessments and to assist you in communicating back your answers and ideas? Would parents appreciate a skilled interpreter when speaking with a teacher whose language is very different from English? Would you desire the advocacy of a social worker, especially within a political regime that does not fully welcome your presence in the country? Would you want to be in a school that has a high success rate of graduation or have the tools you need to become a valedictorian in other district schools? As a 20-year veteran to public school teaching, I have worked in many different educational environments and witnessed the marginalization of students who are new to English. RIA's transition program, however, is a phenomenal immersion experience into a safe, loving, nurturing, and culturally relevant academic environment. How are you going to ensure that the other schools are ready for these rare and beautiful seedlings? Will the soil be rich for the thriving? Can you answer the following questions before making the decision to discontinue RIA's program element and grades K through five? I'm sorry, but this is the timer and we will post all of these to the webpage. I wanna thank my colleague Kalia Wade for her assistance in reading these and assure you that this is not an easy task to do. We try to do it with compassion and understanding and try to read your words as you read them and hope that we've done a good job for you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Marisol, and thank you, Kalia, that you're, you're right. It's not an easy thing to do and to convey one's, um, the writer's intentions uh, is even more difficult in this context. But I think Commissioner Powell said it best the last time we met. Uh, you guys, you in particular, Marisol, did an excellent job. Kalia, you as well, we appreciate that. And I thank my colleagues for affording um, these citizens the opportunity to uh, speak tonight uh, because in this context um, it was the appropriate and just thing to do. Um, relying on my words, uh, they were they chose not to speak and uh, I'm glad you gave them the opportunity to speak tonight and um, more of course will be said on RIA's future along with the rest of the budget issues and decisions the board has to make. I'm just uh, providing some context for the people who spoke tonight. Uh, there's a huge budget, hundreds and hundreds of pages involving lots of programs and staff people. We're gonna have lots of conversations and those conversations will include, of course, uh, the RIA. And uh, I'm sure my colleagues will take into account everything that you said today. So again, we appreciate your comments. Uh, our job is to listen uh, with no guards up about what you have to say and to accept it. And uh, I've heard a number of comments about me today, and I accept them. Uh, next item on our agenda is the advisory council reports. We have no advisory council reports. Um, and uh, so we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. The next item on the agenda is no uh, board reports. There are no board reports today. Uh, next item on the agenda is Dr. Nelms. You have your superintendent's report. John. Good evening, everyone. It's going to wave and do a wave there. Um, so uh, this is new for me. I, I've been watching the board meetings, but I have not done this through Zoom. And though I'm on Zoom meetings most days from eight in the morning to eight at night, it seems, and your eyes get tired. So I'm going to keep this relatively um, short. And um, if the do I do I Zoom it myself, or is it going to be shared by uh, Tom Mohan? I will share. All right. Or Kelly, I'm sorry. And my question, Kelly, do I need to pull up myself and zoom through? Because I can't see the, the presentation if you share it, or I assume I can. Uh, no, I'm just looking for it right now. I'm going to have it in five seconds. No problem, no. I think everyone needs a break anyways from the, uh, from the speakers, just to kind of process a lot, a lot of that information. So we'll make next steps. And so my presentation is relatively uh, short. I kept it, I think, to six slides because I knew there would be a number of speakers tonight. 
And then uh, for the resolutions, we have a few uh, tenure recommendations, two administrators, I believe, and three teachers. And uh, that's all that we have for this evening. So it should be relatively short um, moving forward. Thank you, Kaya. So the next slide, um, just a few quick announcements. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Valerie Marsh from the University of Rochester, who co-wrote an article with me that was published in the March edition of Education Leadership, and it focused on and featured the voices of our students. Um, I will get uh, the board a copy of that. Um, it was about um, what happens when you give students um, advocacy and voice. We had wrote the article um, about six months ago, but it was being published right around a time when students were protesting a number of decisions by um, by the governor and, and other situations where kids were marching um, in Albany. And, and this particular uh, article was um, written in time for us to, uh, to share some of that also. So it talks about how schools um, should consider giving kids voice, or they must give kids voice to truly understand how to change um, the curriculum, the instruction, the school environment, and the benefits of that. And of course, we've seen the benefits of that at East with our academic program, also our sports program. One of our sophomores today was just offered a full ride to Siena College for basketball. That was a big surprise while I was on the phone. I got a text for that. And so people are really starting to pay attention to what's happening in Rochester. I'm happy to be part of the district and, and part of that, that story. But we will make sure we get you a hard copy to, of this article. Um, I think you'll be proud of, of what's happening uh, with our students throughout the district. The next slide, um, I want to give our school administrators a ton of credit on the next slide. They have been in every day since uh, we closed schools to ensure that not only are our students receiving food um, because we are a food distribution site at East. And today, I think we, today I was reported to me, we gave over 400 meals today. Um, and we originally were, were giving meals up around a 200 to 250 um, uh, rate. So we saw a huge uh, uptick in families coming and getting meals at East, which is great, which means the word's getting out. Within the community, we see we saw an increase in walkers, so kids from the community are coming, um, which is good. So the word is getting out, and I'm happy that families are taking advantage of the, uh, the provisions that the district has uh, provided them. But our administrator is led by uh, Dr. Tanya Wilson, who's up top uh, for lower school, six through eight. Um, they understood there was a huge gap and uh, equity for students who didn't have access to computers. And what we realized when calling parents and talking to students, it wasn't that kids didn't have Wi-Fi necessarily. Some of them, their parents needed their laptops all day to do Zoom meetings and work, so they couldn't give them their laptops to do homework. So there was a number of, of issues that we faced and, and problems that we helped solve by distributing um, Chromebooks. And I know that uh, as of um, yesterday, um, that number 200 is now around 350. So that number uh, increased uh, quite a bit over the bit, and that's, that's for grades six through eight only. Uh, grades nine through 12, like the rest of the district, they already have Chromebooks and they've had those all year. I also wanna take this time to acknowledge the work of the IT department. It's my understanding that um, uh, computers will be given to all students across the district. There's some information on uh, Terry's Twitter and the district's Twitter and Facebook page uh, and email that all students throughout the district, uh, grades six through eight will have access two laptops, uh, I believe they're gonna be sending information next week and uh, they'll be distributed the week after. So I wanna make sure that I acknowledge what's happening with the rest of the district. Also, I think it's really important that students have access to these materials so they can compete with their peers in other uh, districts. We also gave students a ton of books as well. Uh, we gave them three books to read um, as well as laptops for those who wanted to do that. Um, as a promotional opportunity with our students, trying to keep them engaged a little bit, uh, we partnered with Chaz Bruce, who is a local um, artist. We don't have to show it, Kali, it's fine. He's is a, is a local artist um, and uh, was recognized in the newspaper recently for his ability to engage students in different ways using a medium called TikTok. And we have a TikTok challenge for our kids at East and for the kids at RCSD. And it's, it's just a really uh, interactive way of getting kids to get up and moving and thinking. And it was also an opportunity for us to just re-engage kids back to the school. So if they do this activity, they have an opportunity to have their video posted to Chaz Bruce's site, where he has over 3 million followers internationally. 
And so it's the kids, it's, it's the thing they're into. Um, I did one with my daughter and my son recently. It is much harder than it looks. <laughs> it took me about 60 tries, an hour and a half to get it down. And, uh, and I don't think I could repeat it unless I took another hour and a half to, uh, to practice again. But it, it's, it's challenging. It's movement. It's, it's, it's beat. It's, it's a little bit more than dancing um, and a lot of memorization, but it's a lot of coordination. And so we're trying to engage kids in different ways while they're away. And this is a medium that all the kids are using. And uh, we'll, uh, again, for the sake of time, we'll share this with you. You can look at the, the YouTube videos. There's the actual how to do it. It's, there's a tutorial link and then the actual video itself that you have to mimic. And then they're going to submit those videos to Chaz's um, um, Instagram and or TikTok account. So I encourage you all to try it too if you want. Um, I also want to thank Summit Federal Credit Union. Uh, the C Summit Federal Credit Union is located about a half a mile from East. And uh, several years ago, we started partnering with local businesses for a variety of initiatives, um, pizza places and, and uh, food spots. And the bank became one of our partners also. And they created a scholarship opportunity um, for East students focused on financial literacy. And uh, they work with some students and two students, Bria and Jaheem, both receive generous scholarships from Summit Federal Credit Union. And because there were so many students who, who um, were interested in financial literacy and trying to learn more about how to uh, create savings and how to use uh, bank accounts, Summit decided to give each of those students who applied uh, $50 a Visa card. Um, so I really wanna thank Summit publicly for, for approaching us with this idea. And I wanna thank one of Washington for organizing that within the school to ensure that students actually participated. And uh, again, Bria and Jaheen were the big winners and they receive a generous scholarship from the Summit Federal Credit Union. We continue to try to partner with our Beachwood, uh, Emma and Mark of Heights um, community um, uh, partners and businesses. We think that it truly takes a village and, and these folks, are, been, they've been supportive over the last five years. And the next slide, Kelly. This is so hard when you have the slides in front of you. And, and that is it. That's our brief report. Now I encourage you to share the TikTok videos with your social media friends and Again, um, I think you should also try. It's pretty fun to try to coordinate and see what the kids are doing these days. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I appreciate uh, you're making that report brief. It's been already a long night and um, summarizing that uh, has uh, allowed us to move forward. Um, will you make available to us that, will you send us those links, links for those TikTok things? Yep, I'll send you a link for TikTok and I'll send, I'll give it to Marisol. So I'll give her um, the link to the hard copy of the article also. Yeah, I saw the article. He was a teacher in the district at one time, wasn't he? Why do I think he was, a, or is he a teacher? The article of Valerie Marsh or the- uh, Valerie Oh, Chaz. Marsh. Oh, Chaz. Chaz. Chaz was a teacher in the district. He's a long, yep. he was born and raised here. Um, mm -hmm. He was, um, he's always around doing crazy stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, the ride along videos with the mayor and some other individuals. But um, he, he's he's really talented individual. Cares a ton about kids. And mm -hmm. anytime we anytime we we partner, we try to deal with local folks first. And, and Chaz has to do on those individuals. I see Commissioner Shepard is raising her hand. Commissioner um, Shepard. I thought this had a page number on it, but it's missing it. Um, I guess it's page number three. Um, for page number three, I wanted to know, you had said um, that the number is probably around 350 at this point. Uh, do you know how many of your students are without Chromebooks? Um, uh, I would tell you that every we've called every single home to see if there was a need. So I'm pretty confident to say any student who, who uh, said they, they needed one, have one. Um, but just because they don't have a Chromebook doesn't mean that they don't have a computer at home. So, so some kids said they were fine, they had their own computer. Um, some families we actually gave two computers to because they may have had a sibling in another school and the parents wanted to have multiple uh, sets. So um, I, I can confidently say that there are no students who indicated they needed a computer that, that does not have one. Okay, do you know how many kids you did not give a Chromebook to? How many students you didn't give a Chromebook? Uh, I could find that number. Um, are you asking Commissioner Shepard? Sean, can we just, can I help clarify something? Sure. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify that we, there are actually close to 350 students in the lower grades and we've given approximately almost 200 computers. So um, I think that you say the 350, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Yeah. That that's what we said. 
Okay. And um, are you guys tracking the usage um, of your students? Yeah, we have a, uh, a, a, a uh, we keep it in Google Chrome. And so each student had to, you know, sign a waiver that they had the computers. Of course, we went through a process for that. And, uh, and then now they have them. We have teachers uh, who are separated. We have, we have a family group structure where each teacher has 10 kids they support every day. Those family group uh, Karen, those Karens are the ones who are checking with those 10 kids, making sure they're on or doing their homework and, and they get, they're getting access. So there is a structure for that. Okay. Any other, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner LeBron? Yeah, just for clarification. Um, so the Chromebooks, are they coming from ESA's budget or they're coming from just RCSD overall and the efforts that the district's doing overall? Let me, can I, can I restate that question to make sure I understand what you're saying, Beatrice? So when we, um, when we, when the East was, created, we had uh, PSG and CSSG grant funds, and we bought Chromebooks carts for all students in the building. And so it's those uh, Chromebooks that we, that we deploy out to school, out to kids. It's still RCSD money. It just came through a grant. That makes sense. Yeah, so these were kind of Chromebooks that were already allocated to your school. You're yeah. just distributing them in the home at this point. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So, so yeah. So, thank you for that, that question. So, no, these were not new purchases in the last month. These were Chromebooks that were sitting in classrooms, not being used while kids are home. Um, Sean, you might have uh, addressed this, and I apologize if I missed it. But um, I think nationally, sixty percent of homes uh, have access to the internet, um, and I know the district um, has been trying to increase that number through a variety of ways. So, uh, MiFi is, is one of them. Yeah. Um, so let's assume that everybody has a hand, uh, a Chromebook and, um, or a computer of their own. Uh, do we know how saturated uh, the internet is in our communities? Um, I, I don't know. I know that, you know, Anne-Marie Lanner, when she was head of IT, she started doing this work I mean, three or four mm -hmm. years ago. Yep. And they were uh, doing an analysis of that then. Um, and I will say that proactively before COVID-19, we had surveyed our students grades nine through 12 because they all were being given Chromebooks this year um, as a district. And those who did not have internet, we gave them MiFi's too. Um, so I know we knew nine, 12 was pretty secure because they had been using Chromebooks all school year. Okay. Um, six through eight was a new issue. And so for some students who we had received MiFi's, Others, we gave the, the resources like from Spectrum that was giving free internet and other, um, um, I think Sprint was doing some things and Verizon was doing some things. We gave as many resources as we can. What I can't guarantee you is that a student who has it, that every kid who receives a, who has a Chromebook has Wi-Fi. They all indicated that they did, but I mm -hmm. think intermittent, some kids are using their cell phone hotspots um, as hotspots yeah, for some of their work. So I think they're being very creative. As, as one parent said to me, and I don't, I don't want to spray paint with a broad stroke, but she said, my kids had a phone all year. They know how to find Wi-Fi. So, so uh, whatever that means, you know, um, to that parent. But I think it was just important that the kids had the device and the resources. Do you, uh, is Anne-Marie or someone from the IT department uh, on this uh, Zoom grid anywhere? I don't see her name. Because I know that... Uh, they, nine through 12, everybody has Chromebooks. And I know if you look on our website, for example, they'll tell you that they're pushing it down to six. Six through eight, yeah. Yep. I, I, yeah, I saw something recently that- I think I heard, I, I know. I'm sorry, Ben, you, you paused. President I thought you were White. What's that? No, President White, it's Mike Schmidt. Oh, Mike, do you, can yes, you uh, up to, give us up to date on that? Uh, yes, we're uh, we are doing Chromebook distribution starting on Monday. Uh, Glenn Vanderwater is heading that up. He and his team put together a uh, a plan. So we're going to start the distribution on Monday at Edison. I can uh, touch base with him tomorrow so we can give you a, a more thorough uh, uh, more thorough update. But uh, we are we're we're starting our our distribution Monday. Commissioner White, this is Glenn Vanderwater. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there he is. Yes. <laughs> oh, hey, Glenn. Hi, how are you? Uh, so far, we have 1,000. Good, how are you? Uh, 180 students signed up for uh, Chromebook pickup at the Edison Tech campus for week one. Week two, we'll move to the Douglas campus. Um, and we're already booked 
Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week. Now, these students are in what grades? Grades six through eight, but it also includes any students in grades nine through 12 that may not have picked up their Chromebook to date. And we started that deployment back in September. I, my internet connect. Thank you, Froze Van. Glenn, I have to apologize. Um, uh, go ahead, Commissioner LeBron. I see Commissioner you LeBron. You froze. That's that's all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, oh, you were telling me I froze. That I raised my hand, but you froze. Oh, okay. Commissioner all right. So why don't you go first, and then uh, well, go, Commissioner Powell. Okay. I was. Uh, she had her hand up first, but I'll go. Yeah, I know. I, I just right. want to ask about um, K through uh, fifth grade. So I know. I mean, I, I keep up with the social media and the announcements from RCSD, um, but many parents want to know what's the plan for K through fifth grade myself included I have a third grader whose laptop went kaput to her own doing and I only have one laptop myself at home and so I'm working all day I can't share my laptop with her and then in the evenings we typically have meetings or I have zoom meetings so I, I just want to understand if there's conversations around uh, K through fifth graders and what that's going to look like so right now, our main focus is on the sixth through uh, eighth grade deployment. We're doing a phased approach because we're talking close to, the scale is much larger uh, for Rochester. It's 4,000 laptops is what we're estimating. So as we uh, finish this deployment, uh, based on the superintendent's recommendation, executive cabinet, we will drop down to lower grade levels, but there are implications with that. Nationally, they're really one-to-one. -one, um, while there are some outliers, I should say, where there's one-to-one -one laptop to, or Chromebook deployments to those grade levels, uh, that's not consistent uh, throughout the country. So, but we will be prepared um, if the superintendent calls on us to drop to a lower grade level. So, can I, um, Van? I just have a sure, quick sure. follow-up in mm -hmm. regards to that. I know that. Um, at school 15 in third grade, they also use a program that is through the um, Amazon tablet. It's called Osmosis that they have, or Osmo. You can buy it at Target too. I'm going to text her a teacher while we're talking because her teacher is really tech savvy too, and she has all the families on the Seesaw app. So shout out to Miss Smith mm -hmm. for that in school 15. But um, I'm just wondering if that is also a different alternative, a, a tablet with the apps that we use um, in the district versus a laptop for the lower grades as well. So that would be a new expense for the district. I will say though, um, earlier today, I did do a study where over one third of our students who are in K through five, while this doesn't address all of our students, one, over one third of our students in K through five have a sibling in grades six through 12 so there is an opportunity to share a device there. Um, we are deploying uh, printed resources out to the food distribution sites that now include school seven. So that's 17 sites where we have paper pencil resources available at those sites. You all set, uh, Commissioner LeBron? Yeah, I just wanna say though, like not everybody can actually make it to the sites. Um, you know, there's a lot of families who have multiple children who are not going to take the hike or the walk or the drive over there. So, you know, I've, I've asked families to email me if that's the case and we'll try to mail them out a packet. Um, but I also know that there's still some challenges and areas that we could be addressing in a different way. There, there, certainly, there, certainly, are some, there, there certainly are some challenges and we're trying to address them as quickly as possible. Um, as, as they come to us. Uh, right now, we have to stay laser focused on our six through eight deployment, making sure that every student um, that needs a Chromebook has the opportunity to get one. And again, that's in the thousands. And that um, employs our building technicians going to our elementary sc uh, schools to uh, take out the Chromebooks from the Chromebook carts. We're starting with the Dell 11 inch, our oldest series Chromebook, um, so that as we go to a distribution site, we have those devices available. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Powell. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I've got to be the curmudgeon here and ask um, uh, if you could outline the inventory control process so that when kids do return back to school and, and that we, we know how to get these devices back so they can be used by the next group of, of young people? That's a great question. And the Dell 11 inch, the ones that we're deploying, were scheduled to be um, recycled at the end of this school year. While they're not being supported by Google, they are still 100% functional and working. We're making sure that every device that's being deployed has been sanitized and is in good working order for our students. And because we were anticipating the deployment, or pardon me, the retirement of those devices, we have a refresh cycle in place uh, to refresh those carts in those elementary buildings when our students return in September. So you're saying that, that these were fully amortized and basically is considered to have zero uh, value to the district at this point? Uh, they would have had zero value at the end of this. I don't want to say zero value because we do get recycling uh, funds back for the precious metals that reside within the machines, but they would have been of zero use academically at the conclusion of this school year. So we would be re uh, recycling those devices and refreshing with brand new ones, which we would be doing through smart bond funding. So the, the end expectation is that these uh, young people can have these devices and keep them. I don't want to say that we're giving away district okay. funds because I don't think I'm in the position to be able to say that. But what I can say is that as our students, and as we, we're apparently moving to a uh, grade seven through 12, because our sixth graders will be coming seventh graders, as we move to a seven through 12, one-to-one -one take home type environment, when students return back to school, they can return their Dell 11 inch back to the building and receive a brand new device that has a four year warranty on it. Okay, so let me just, active listening, you're saying that uh, we expect the students to be good stewards of the, these, this equipment to bring it back and, and so on, but if we didn't get it back, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It, it really wouldn't be the end of the world, um, yeah. but it's our expectation. And I will say this, and I have to put this out there in benefit to our students, that when we talk to other school districts similar to Rochester, New York, such as Hartford, Connecticut, where they were seeing 5% damaged or stolen Chromebooks, here in Rochester, we're only seeing 1% of lost, damaged, or stolen Chromebooks. Our students are taking the devices in grades nine through 12 in this initial deployment and really caring for the device that they're giving. And I'm, I'm hoping to see that as we drop down to lower grade levels. It's far exceeding what we're seeing um, when we talk to other school districts across the country. Uh, and, and Glenn, very quickly, because Dr. Nelms covered some of it, uh, you know, the national data, at least the last time I heard, is about 60% of districts like ours have access to the internet. Is our community faring any better? And so we give the equipment, the hardware to these students, but what do we know about, and again, you can be very brief, what do we know about their ability to access the internet? And, and I thought I remember reading something recently that there has been an effort to increase the access to the internet specifically here in this community. Could you tell us briefly about that? Yes, Commissioner White. So um, what we're, I, while I don't have a specific percentage for you, um, the One Million Project, which is providing MIFIs for the entire city school district, has allowed us to drop down to grade levels that include K through 12. Okay. So uh, we're in the process of ordering those MIFIs for students. Um, we're actively, right now, we're actively putting out surveys, and you may have heard about this through the robocall that can be completed either through dial tone push, uh, push button or through accessing the, um, uh, the survey that we have online to identify students that don't have access to the internet and provide them uh, a district MIFI. That'll take approximately four weeks to receive uh, from the One Million Project. 
Excellent. And that's, 50, that's 57. Um, and on top of that, we're, we're expecting for free an, an additional 5,700 uh, devices. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Vanderwater? Uh, I don't see any. All right, uh, next item uh, on the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Nelms, for providing that report and opening up that issue which uh, uh, relates to the entire district, that is access to hardware and the internet. Um, obviously, this is gonna be the new normal. And at some point, I think uh, my colleagues and I will wanna know what East and the rest of the district is doing to uh, advance the cause of online learning. Before, previously, the conversations was it was cheating. Online learning was cheating and it was selling students short. But hey, this is my daughter sitting home from Hampton University and doing all her coursework. They said, don't, don't even bother to come back. Uh, they're doing all their coursework. And I'm hearing that increasingly. So that is going to be the new normal. And, and uh, I know we're not behind as compared to other districts. A lot of districts are struggling with how do you do this? So. Um, it will be great at an appropriate time to ask uh, yourself and uh, Terry, um, what is the future for distance learning uh, comprehensively across the district? So thank you very much for opening up that uh, can of worms because that's a can we need to keep. President White. Uh, next item in the end of the district super, yes, uh, yeah, Vice I President Elliott. I just wanted to yep. um, uh, share within that conversation. I do think that, um, the online learning uh, would be a great asset for our community, for our, our students, particularly because of the um, issues and responsibilities that they have in their uh, home life. Uh, they may have children, yeah. um, you know, they may have to, you know, just watch children on behalf of their family members. So I, I think, and you know, I've been very, very, um, um, a, a, you know, just an advocate of, uh, the fact that you know sometime in the future we're not going to need as much brick and mortar because uh, i just think that i mean you look at what's happening with the retail outlets and and and, and those kinds of things how more and more people are using the um the internet for their, their purchases for their goods and services and uh, many of us you know like your daughter uh mr president are doing their coursework uh, online and that's just the that's what's happening around um, the world even prior to uh, COVID-19. So, you know, some, somewhere in the future, I think we have to make uh, online learning far more of a major uh, initiative in our district than we have in the, in the past. So it, it, it may also mean a reduction in, in personnel or what have you, but, you know, this is, this is the wave of the future. So I think we have to um, prepare ourselves for it somewhere down the line. I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, Commissioner LeBron. I just got to say, I was listening to Commissioner Elliott, and I hear you, but let me just tell you, uh, three weeks in this house with Sophia, I'm not, I don't want to move to no brick and mortar model, and um, I need her to be in a brick and mortar building with some teachers. She is, I love my kid. I will not complain about her. <laughs> but she is I need her to be with her teachers and that learning needs to happen for her uh, she's very hands-on I don't even have the time I'm over here like two, two hours I'm texting her teacher like help so I hear you but Mr. President's uh, daughter is in college and you know the same thing happened with my I had to go online but I need them to be brick mortar as long as possible well I don't know if you've seen some of the uh, Facebook posts but there's one mother that has her son hung up on a line there's another mother who's working and has her son taped to the floor, you know, so there are a lot of just, uh, you know, comical Listen, kinds I'm willing of, to, uh, I'm willing to drop Sophie off even for a day. <laughs> then you can come back to this conversation. <laughs> so well, hopefully the parents will be, will be going back to work, so that won't be the case, so. I saw Commissioner Powell raise her hand, but also before that, give the yellow clap sign uh, that Commissioner Adams had given. Commissioner Powell, you want to add something to this? Only that if nothing else comes out of this, our teachers will be so much more valued at the <laughs> other end than they have been for the last few years through this whole sort of deprofessionalization of our work, of our teaching force. So that's it. I also saw Commissioner Malloy uh, silently or traditionally old school way applauding. She's got, how many kids you got at home? 
four and they're all district students right so um it's it's tough yeah but you're right mine is old she goes up into her room and she ain't even trying to associate with us so it, i do it is it is apples and oranges but okay uh oh commissioner malloy you want to say something i'm just going to add to what you said you know when you have four kids competing for computer time and lack of internet right but um you can only have so many Zoom meetings going at once right. before the internet stops working. So um, I can definitely empathize with a lot of families across the district right now. And that face-to-face -face contact with their teachers, it just nothing compares to that. Um, although they're doing a wonderful job providing educational resources for our kids. I think they want to get back to their friends to tell you the they truth. They do, yeah. <laughs> okay, and next item on the agenda, I don't see, um, the superintendent Dade online, and unless he clicks in, uh, I can uh, indicate uh, why he is not here. We uh, He was going to give a superintendent's update on the budget, uh, but as you all know, foundation aid uh, uh, is somewhat unclear, at least to some of us. Additionally, the school run aid, I don't know if any of you have ever read a school run aid printout. I, I saw one yesterday evening and it, it's like uh, hieroglyphics. It's really hard to understand. Um, so I asked uh, Superintendent Dade, uh, actually before I asked Superintendent Dade, uh, I spoke to our, our colleagues, some of your colleagues, uh, Vice President Elliott, the chair of our finance committee, um, if they thought it was appropriate before he uh, issues his report to meet um, as a group uh, to, see if we could understand and and commissioner powell back me up on this when I, as soon as i got those runs she has seen them for many years many more than i have and she has a financial background i said hey can you explain this to me and it's really there's only a couple people uh who can really understand them but uh i i did think it was important to uh, speak to the leaders of our finance group which would of course be commissioner lebron and vice president elliott and they agreed they thought it was appropriate for us to meet with them um, Superintendent Dade. So you will be getting that report from Superintendent Dade. Uh, I would imagine no later than, because we don't have any other meetings. This is Thursday. Probably will be uh, April 7th. Uh, but again, I, I, I consulted with our, our other leaders in this group and they thought it was appropriate that we speak to him first. Uh, Vice President Elliott or uh, Commissioner LeBron, did you want to add or take away from anything I just said? Um, just add, nothing to take away other than I know that we're going to be meeting with the superintendent tomorrow, but my expectation and my hope um, is that Terry would then call two commissioners at a time and have a, the same follow up conversation Absolutely. with them so that they have the opportunity to ask him questions directly. Um, I do not support the other commissioners um, not being filled in on the 7th. I think they should be addressed tomorrow, but because of open meeting laws, uh, the most appropriate way is for us to do three, two, and two. So uh, absolutely, that would happen. We're trying to set up a meeting. I think it's nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Marisol, is that correct? Eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Eight o'clock. Um, Vice President Elliott and uh, Commissioner LeBron, but absolutely, that will be followed by meetings with you all. Commissioner Shepard, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, so uh, Marisol get, uh, sent out the presentation already right before this meeting. Um, so I did look through it. Is that the same presentation that you're saying is, is going to be put on hold? Uh, I haven't seen it. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. I don't think Commissioner LeBron has seen Have you seen it? I have seen it. It is the same. I haven't. Um, it's the same presentation, but I think it's also conversations that need to be had before that presentation. Any, uh, let's see, I'm looking yeah, at the so list. Is it, it going to be presented on the 7th? Because I didn't see anything in there that was confusing. I'm okay with waiting. I'm just saying, right. I mean, you posed it like it was confusing, but it wasn't. No, I didn't, I didn't use the word confusing. I said there's a lot of information. I said the runs are confusing. You posed it like it was confusing. That's what I said. No, no, no. What I said is the runs, the, uh, the aid runs are confusing to me. They're hieroglyphics. I don't understand them. I have additional questions regarding foundation aid. As you all know, you've been tracking my emails. I've been sending them every other day regarding the education stabilization uh, fund. I don't have answers to those questions. I think there are questions about uh, what the governor may or may not do uh, with respect to that particular fund. 
he's even saying, I saw him on the news the other day saying, I'm not even gonna accept that money. And if I don't accept the money, there'll be no strings attached. So I think there are a lot of questions that should be resolved uh, or I, I want an opportunity of answering As you all know, when I've sent those questions because you filed the responses, I haven't gotten a response because I think what I understood is the administration didn't have a response. So I, I have not seen that presentation, uh, but I, I do have questions. And when I called my colleagues, they were of the same ilk. They believed too that there were questions to be answered. So, any other questions or comments regarding? Yes, Commissioner LeBron. Well, I just want to add that when you called, I hadn't seen the presentation, but oh, okay. I opened the email and saw it. And the presentation, I, I do think, answers a lot of questions. And it is the presentation itself is clear, but I do know what you mean because I did try to go to the state website and pull some information from there prior to even this conversation. And it is very dense. It's like reading regulations, um, but. I, I, like I said, I'm okay with meeting with Terry tomorrow, but my expectation is that Terry then meets with two other commissioners to a phone conference and have follow-up conversations with them. Any, I'm looking at the grid here. Anybody else? Question, comment? Uh, Commissioner Shepard? So is Terry going to be setting up meetings with us? Uh, I would assume so. He's, he's very accommodating in terms of trying to set up the meeting for tomorrow morning. Um, I'm working on that. And and Madisol, who's always good at that, will I'm sure make it happen. Uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, consideration of resolutions. Uh, we would begin with resolution 805 now, unless someone needs to discuss those uh, granting of tenure resolutions in executive session. Anybody feel a need to uh, discuss those resolutions in executive session? Um, could you go back to the regular grid? Because I can't see if people are raising. I, thank you. Um, I don't see anybody raising their hand. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, Commissioner LeBron. Yes, I just want to say that um, I read these resolutions. They came through the courier earlier. Um, and the dates of 723. So there's nothing in particular to these individuals and 630. And so to keep consistent with my other votes um, on other tenure positions that are coming before us in the month of April in advance to these actual dates. I, I will not be supporting them, but it's nothing against these individuals. Any other questions or comments regarding uh, resolution 805? If I can just explain to, to the board why that is, that was um, a process that the uh, HR department asked us to consider so you guys don't get bombarded with hundreds of um, recommendations all at once. So I just, I just, if, I just want to make sure people know why, whether early. Harry explained that before too. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm fully aware that they put, they brought forth that recommendation. They did it to us, you know, at the last board meeting with the district staff as well, or administrators from, or teachers and tenures from other schools. But I was not comfortable voting that far in advance. So I just want to, to reiterate that it's nothing against these individuals um, and take away from their work and their ability to you know, receive tenure tonight, I just will not be supporting it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding resolution 805? Are there being no further questions or comments, all those in favor of resolution 805 say aye. I'll take a roll call vote, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Malloy? Uh, aye. I already heard Commissioner Adams, he said aye. Uh, Vice President Elliott. Uh, yes, I use this thing over here, but my vote. No, we're not, we're not doing not that. that. Our clerk said, uh, no, no. Oh, okay. uh, Nope. Um, is that right, Madam Clerk? We're not doing that. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Shepard? No. Uh, Commissioner Powell? Yes. Uh, Commissioner LeBron? No. And I'm a yes. Uh, so by my calculation, the eyes would have it. I next need a motion to discuss resolution, uh, strike that. With respect to resolution 818, I would uh, make a motion to table. I, we've had some preliminary conversation about this at our last executive session. I said I was gonna make that motion today. Uh, I would just like, well, motion to table goes directly to a vote. So- uh, President White- uh, I'm, I'm, Yes, Commissioner Powell. Um, procedurally, doesn't it need to be lifted from the table and, and 
uh, moved and seconded before it can be tabled? No, this was never uh, brought as this is the first time as appears as a resolution. We were talking about it uh, because it was a personnel matter, an executive session, but this is actually the first time we've actually looked at the uh, resolution. Is that right, um, Mr. Christoph or Madam Clerk? I understand that it's never been brought before us, but don't you have to have a, oh. a motion before you table it? If we were in a large assembly, that would be in order, but given that we are in a small body format, uh, what you suggest is also appropriate. Okay, thank you. In addition, yes, I need, you need to uh, have a date specific to yep. when you are tabling it. Uh, my thought is to table it to April the 7th uh, and um, have some conversation about it in executive session again on April the 7th because it's a personnel matter. And then if we reach some resolution, uh, vote on it on April the 7th. Motion to table till April 7th. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, I heard Commissioner Adams. All those in favor of uh, tabling resolution 818 say aye. Aye. Oh, aye. I'll take a roll call vote. I'm sorry, Commissioner Adams. Uh, Commissioner Malloy. Aye. Commissioner Adams. I heard you say aye, aye already. Aye. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Elliott. Yes. Uh, will, Commissioner Powell. Yes. Commissioner uh, uh, LeBron. No. Uh, Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Uh, the ayes have it. The matter has been adjourned to a date certain of April the 7th, 2020. Next item on the agenda is uh, Resolution 818, which is the appointment of the district-wide uh, school safety team. Is there a motion? No, is that 818 or 820? 819. Uh, 819. If I said 818, I'm, 18, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, you're right. It's 819. Right. Is, is there a motion? Let me just get it on the floor first. Motion. Been moved Second. by Commissioner LeBron, seconded by Vice President Elliott. Is there uh, any comments or questions regarding Resolution 819? Right. The, the, the board representative is Anissa, and I was wondering if that meant that it had to be a board person specifically. Because uh, if it's a board person specifically, I would like to serve on that. But if it's a, just a board representative, then we can go with Anissa, but I just, I was thinking that would be something that I would like to participate in. But uh, however it um, it's supposed to be, I'm okay with it. Mr. Christoph, can you tell us whether it is required that it be a staff person or a board person, or can it be anybody we want it to be? I don't have the specific regulation in front of me. So Mike, perhaps if you do, uh, please chime in. Uh, but but my belief is that the board can have a designee just so long as the board makes the designation. Mr. Schmidt, can you enlighten us on this? Subject? <laughs> I believe I, I believe uh, Carl is correct, and uh, we would love to have uh, Vice President Elliott on the team. And I know Anissa's got her hands full. I obviously didn't speak to her about this. I see your name up there. Anissa, are you there? Yes, I'm here actually. Um, the language is representative of the board and I needed to see the agenda. I was hoping that the resolution would move forward, but there's no reason why the board couldn't add, take me off, keep me on with someone else, but it's just a representative of the school board. So I, I'm there as a school staff because I was trying to move this agenda forward for compliance purposes. So uh, Commissioner LeBron, were you gonna say something? Yeah, so in the actual resolution, it reads the district wide school safety team must be appointed by the Board of Education and include, but not limited to, representatives of the school board, teacher, administrator, and parent organizations, school safety personnel, and other school personnel, and reviewed annually. So it's in the actual resolution, the language, and I would read representatives of the school board as school board member directly to serve. That's the, Oh, I'm sorry. I just, my um, only feedback on it is that it says Ruth Turner Student Services and she is, and, but it, Mike Schmidt is listed as Chief of Operations and Ruth is still the Chief of Social and Emotional Learning that has not been voted on. Um, I know that it's proposed in 2021, but I do want resolutions to be as accurate, representative as possible. So I would ask that we do a friendly amendment 
to correct the language in there in the title officially. But uh, given that I don't want to, uh, I don't want to muddy this. I, I will withdraw. No problem. Uh, let, let me just say, um, I don't think it would be muddying it, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, Anissa, chime in if I'm wrong on this, but we could add uh, Vice President Elliott. Absolutely. Um, Right, so it's right, Mr. Smith. There's no reason why it says representative um, representatives. Actually, is what it says. So you could go on there if you want to. Well, I guess if if, if there's anything, having thinking about, I really just wanted to be a part of that. Um, but if there's anything that is voted on that may have to come to the board that I may have to vote on, will there appear to be any conflict of interest or anything like that in this scenario? I okay. I see nope. Carl's shaking yeah. his head. No. Okay. No. So, so we're going to ask for, yes. Motion to amend to add Commissioner Elliott's name uh, under the board representation. Could you also add uh, uh, another amendment to add the title Chief of Student Services for Ms. Turner? If, if, that's, if that's the correction, sure. Is that right? OK. So, um, there's been a motion to amend resolution 819 to uh, correct the title for Ms. Turner and to add the uh, name of uh, Vice President Cynthia Elliott to the team, the safety team. Uh, is there a second to that? Is, who's I'll made second. the motion? Commissioner Powell did. And uh, okay. Commissioner LeBron, I heard you second it. Uh, any further questions or comments regarding uh, the amendment to resolution, the amendments to resolution 819? Hey, They're President White, I'm yes, sorry. Sir. The, uh, the I, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the titles next to the individual's names, where they were never meant to be their actual um, position titles. So we will amend all of those to represent their okay. actual title within the, uh, within the organization. So I didn't want to create any confusion with that. So. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. All right. Um, all those in favor of the amendments as proposed say, uh, I'm going to take a voice for it. Uh, Commissioner Malloy. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Adams. Aye. Vice President Vice President Elliott? Yes. Commissioner Powell? Yes. Uh, Commissioner uh, LeBron? Yes. Uh, Commissioner uh, Shepard? Yes. <laughs> and I'm a yes, the, it's unanimous. So now, uh, with respect to um, resolution 819 is just amended by the Board of Education. Is there any further questions or comments regarding that resolution before we vote on it? There being no further questions or comments, all those in favor of resolution 819 as amended by Commissioner uh, Powell's motion uh, indicate by a vo voice vote of yes, uh, Commissioner Malloy. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Adams. Aye. Vice President Elliott. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Powell. Yes. Uh, Commissioner LeBron? Yes. And Commissioner Shepard? Yes. And I'm a yes. So the ayes have it. Okay, next item on the agenda is Resolution 820, sort of a companion resolution. It's a district safety plan. Um, can I get a motion to have conversation or advanced discussion on Resolution 820? Okay. And moved by Vice President Elliott. Is there a second? Come on, guys. Second. Uh, Commissioner Adams uh, seconded. Any questions or conversations regarding the, dis the district school safety plan? Mr. I'll look for President, the. Yes, Vice President Elliott. Did, did we have the hearing on this and I missed it? I thought the hearing was not supposed to be until May and that we were not going to present this until the, um, the public hearing that was going to be in we May. We actually had the public hearing was had specific to the district safety plan and the public hearing in may that you're referring to is regarding the school resource officers two different things oh okay all right uh, Anissa, so, i know you were go ahead i just wanted to mention it was actually on november 21st and um i don't i'm not sure i was actually thinking commissioner elliott might have even been present or vice president elliott was present for that particular hearing it was very quick there were no questions but it was held um, back in November. Okay. Any other questions or comments regarding resolution 820? Uh, I wanna just uh, add uh, thank you to Anissa. She has really uh, 
pushed hard to keep this thing moving along. There's statutory obligations that we had to fulfill. And if it weren't for Anissa and Mike, of course, uh, I don't think we'd gotten here today with Resolution 820. So thank you, uh, Ms. Henry Wheeler. We appreciate your effort. Um, any other questions or comments regarding Resolution 820? There being no other questions or comments, all those in favor of Resolution 820 indicate by saying yes when I call the roll. Uh, Commissioner Malloy? Yes. Commissioner Adams? Uh, Vice President Elliott? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Powell? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Shepard? Yeah. And uh, Commissioner LeBron? Yes. By the way, it's uh, it shifts around. Uh, the roll call shifts around based on how the Brady Bunch pitchers have been moved around. So I'm not calling them in any particular order. All right. Uh, suspension appeals, 821. Um, it's a resolution that uh, helps us figure out how we're going to handle these long-term suspend these suspensions. Uh, Kaya, are you still here or are you gone? Or I'm not as all you want to take this? Oh, do you here. want to just uh, give us some context for resolution 821? You context. Um, well, yeah. we discussed in, um, these are not Easts, by the way, Sean. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> um, uh, the, we one, discussed, one, one family, Kelly, one family, right? One, 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 one family, but I know you were wondering. I didn't see an email. <laughs> oh, you're not, you're not. <laughs> I'm texting Lauren, what the heck? <laughs> no, um, we had to tack these on. Um, given the uh, COVID-19 crisis that we are currently having, uh, the board had to consider uh, how to address or respond to st student suspension appeals that have, um, ha have been received in the queue. Uh, we have three students, um, two from Edison and one from Vanguard, um, who had submitted suspension appeals, but given the fact that school is not, in, um, not currently in regular session, uh, the board had to convene um, to discuss these. And so we will discuss them in, in executive session. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, just doing my notes here. We have no unfinished business. We have no new business. I don't see anybody bring, raising any now. Uh, and of course, uh, as Ms. Wade has just indicated, we have to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing these student suspensions and also to discuss matters relating to the employment of a terms and conditions relating to the employment of a particular individual. Um, it, do I have a motion uh, from one of my colleagues? Oh. And moved by Vice President Elliott, seconded by Commissioner Malloy. All those in favor, just indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? The ayes have it. Now, President uh, White? Yes. We will be returning for the public vote on the suspension appeal, correct? That's right. Um, uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, our clerk and I had a conversation after our last meeting with this new technology, you know, in the past we would go upstairs and I would tell people we're gonna reconvene and open the doors upstairs in the superintendent's or downstairs the superintendent's conference room. Well, uh, Tom, um, since we have to reconvene in open session, Tom, I think you have to be around to, and I'm sure you were gonna stick around so that when we finish our executive session, technologically we've got to open back up again and then do our vote, for example, on the student suspensions. So I, I, I know, Tom, you're there. You're, again, you're the wizard behind the curtain. Um, so you're gonna cut, for everybody else listening, we're gonna get, you're gonna get cut off from the feed. And then if you wanna stick around, I don't know how much longer it's gonna be, Tom will click on that magic button, we'll come back into open session, and we will be conducting public business in a public forum. So with that, uh, Yes, ma'am. I, I did want to, um, I did, it just sort of came up um, from the, the emails, um, but it's not, it's old business. Is it something, I, I'm not, it's not on our scheduled uh, agenda. So do I need to wait or can I bring it up here now? Um, well, we, just, we already voted to go into executive session. All right. But no when we come out of executive session, you, you can bring it up then. Okay. Is that all right? That's fine. Okay. All right, Tom, do your thing. And why don't we take a two minute break uh, and uh, then we'll reconvene in executive session. Oh, see you, Sean.
everybody who's still around. We uh, only have one matter to vote on, and that's Resolution 821. Is there a motion to discuss Resolution 821? Motion. Second. And moved by Commissioner Powell, Vice President Elliott, seconded that motion. Any questions or comments regarding Resolution 821, which relates to student suspensions, which we are required by law to discuss in executive session? No further questions or comments. All those in favor of Resolution 821, say aye. Aye. Uh, let's do aye. Voice vote. I'm sorry. Commissioner Powell? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Adams? Aye. Vice President Elliott? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Malloy? Yes. Uh, and I'm a yes. Uh, and I need one more motion to adjourn for the evening. So um, this has been moved by Vice President Elliott. Second by Second. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Adams. All those in favor signify by saying good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>